The Rune Smith. Chapter 181, Getting Dressed. Good day, Mr. Wayland I presume. Ah uh, yes, that's me. Roland wasn't at his best, his face was covered in sweat as he had just walked out of the workshop to get some fresh air. It was still the middle of the day but he didn't really care if people saw his dirty face. All the craftsmen in this world were somewhat expected to be covered in grime. Before him was someone that he never expected to get a home visit from. While his clothes were different now, the man was once the town mayor. During some announcement S at the town square, he had seen him performing some speeches. Even when the new lord showed up this man was there. Good, Mr. Wayland I won't take much of your time as I have only come to deliver a message. The man looked more like an old butler now than a city mayor. It was quite the fancy suit along with a vest and white gloves. In those gloves, he was holding a letter that had a seal with the emblem of the Valyrian household. This is. It's a letter from Lord Arthur Valyrian, the Lord hopes that you respond positively to his call, the details are included in the letter, please read through it with haste. Roland just looked at the sealed letter while spacing out for a moment. The golem that he sent to the new noble was probably the reason for this letter. If this was a reason for joy or despair would only be revealed when he read through it but maybe this butler could answer some questions first. The Lord calls for me. I'm afraid that I'm not allowed to relinquish any more information, I have only been tasked to deliver this letter thus I will bid you farewell Mr. Wayland. The old man bowed quite graciously before him. This reminded him of the old butler from the Arden estate, both of the men had a similar air around them. Ferdinand did appear a bit different now as during the speeches he seemed more relaxed. Now on the other hand it looked like a switch had been flipped and he was now role-playing as a proper high-class butler. Ah yes, good day. Ferdinand turned around and started walking away. Not far away he saw three people holding spears standing next to the forest. There were obviously guards from the city, one of them he recognized to be one of the gate guards. Maybe I should clear out some trees. In the past, he decided to clear out a path towards his store. Without a road, it would be impossible for a carriage to get through the dense forest. It was fine now as it was just the butler, but some nobles would find it offensive if they needed to walk through the forest to get here. The people that delivered the message left, Elidia quickly peeked her head out of the store while Roland was looking at the letter. Wasn't that the mayor? I think it was. Elidia looked down at the item Roland was holding before asking the next question. Did he come to deliver that? It seems so. While he didn't think there would be something incriminating in it, he wasn't sure. Maybe the new lord figured out his true identity and was trying to blackmail him? This was highly unlikely as he wasn't anyone famous when he left the Arden estate. Besides his closest family, no one would probably be able to recognize him at his current age. Probably half his family members would have trouble, Robert was somewhat different as the two had more interactions while they were younger. His two older brothers and sisters only met during the family dinners which grew lesser and lesser with time. Their father was quite busy with military work and did not stay at the estate too much. Only when he returned would they sit down to eat but even then, most of the time his brothers were missing as they were busy with the night academy. It's a letter from the Lord, you probably should go through it alone. Thankfully Elidia didn't prod the issue and just turned around. Roland was even considering reading the letter in front of her to further their trust but he wouldn't be given a chance. They weren't married, so a degree of confidentiality was still out on the table. Just like she didn't pry into his history before he arrived in this city, so did he. Let's see then. After Elidia left he decided to go back to his house and open the letter. With somewhat sweaty palms he held it out in front of his face and started reading. What is that guy thinking? The letter was filled with flowery words and somewhat hard to read. If he was a common blacksmith he would probably had gotten a headache after going through the first few statements. At the beginning of the letter, the person named Arthur started praising his craftsmanship. The golem that he had sent seemed to have done the trick. After the paragraph of praise, he finally arrived at the meat and potatoes of this letter. 
It was actually a call for a business offer. It has come to my attention that you had been wrongfully barred from participation at our Valyrian auction house, I would wish to discuss this issue further. It looked like the Lord had looked into his ban from the auction house. Roland did know that the Valyrian household was the real owner of that establishment and it seemed that he was now getting another chance. So in short he liked the golem so much that he sees a potential business opportunity. Arthur Valyrian was a new player in this growing city. It was normal for him to not have made any contracts with the Dwarven Union or any other powerful merchants. He could very well unban him from the auction house to allow him to reach a broader customer base if he so wished. The question is, why would he be willing to work with me over the dwarves? Couldn't they just supply him with similar wares? Roland wasn't really sure what Arthur's angle here was. While he could make golems that would probably go for a lot, he was still just one man. His output wasn't that great as he would not be able to supply the auction house with constantly golemic constructs. On the other hand, the dwarves could produce more in bulk as they had many more craftsmen. Probably in the future, some higher-leveled smiths would appear, if he went against the auction house they might decide to not use it at all. They had their own shops in which their wares could just sit on the shelves. They didn't really need the auction house at which they also needed to share some of the profits. It was still a good place to drop off some wares as there was a certain spectacle to it. Some people liked to show off in the bidding wars which did inflate the prices. Does he know something I don't? From Roland's standpoint, if people knew his true level and his special class they would probably be willing to invest money into his progress. If he managed to become a tier 3 master runesmith his worth would skyrocket. Was this Arthur banking on his quick progress? Did he want to entrap him in a contract after doing some research? That's a possibility. Roland frowned while putting the letter to the side. At the end of it, he was invited to the auction house. The date was for tomorrow at noon, the person inviting him wasn't losing any time. Either way, I can't just refuse a meeting with the city lord. It was an unwritten rule for any commoner to answer the call of a noble. If he decided to not show up, he would be accused of dishonoring the noble's name. This was an actual law for which you could be thrown into prison. The sentencing depended on the noble and they chose when they felt disgraced. The new lord wishes to see you. Yes, that's why I need your help. Some time had passed since he received the letter and now he was discussing everything with Elidia. I'm not sure if showing up in my usual clothes would be appropriate. Roland never really cared about his appearance, he liked to wear more functional clothes than ones that made him look good. Thus his wardrobe only consisted of things that he could either take into battle, like armor, or workshop gear. Other than that he had loose t-shirts and loose pants that he wore when he was relaxing at home. You are right. I don't think wearing that bulky robe and armor would be appropriate for the visit. Elidia looked to the coat hanger where a dark cloak was hanging. It was one that Roland liked to cover his half-plate armor that he usually paraded through the city in. Then there was the ugly face mask to the side that he also tended to bring with him. To this day Elidia was not sure why he was that pedantic when it came to protecting himself but at this point, she was afraid to ask. Yes but he wishes to need me tomorrow. I'm not sure I'll find anything at the tailor this fast. This was not the modern world, a person needed to go to the tailor and get their measurements. A person would not just create 20 sets of clothes of varying sizes and leave them out on the shelf. With tailoring skills they did work fast though, it wouldn't take longer than a week for the order to be finished. The person with the proper skills wouldn't even need to take measurements of the potential customer. They could just take a snapshot of their dimensions and quickly manufacture anything they had previously worked on. I don't think that will be needed, it was supposed to have been a surprise but... A surprise. Elidia smiled and told Roland to wait a moment as she went to fetch something from the store. After a few minutes, she returned with a locked box in her hands. Roland recognized this box as something that she kept up in the attic. This is... While still being silent, she opened up the box to take out a nice-looking set of clothes. There were pants, a vest, and a nice proper shirt that at first glance looked to be made from some expensive fabric. 
At this moment he recalled that Elidia did have quite a wide range of skills, tailoring was one of them. She was not an expert tailor so she would not be able to work as fast but this did not make her creations any worse. At first, he thought that she might have made it as an acknowledgement for the bracelet that he made for her. The timeline didn't quite add up though as he had given her the bracelet recently and with the orphanage situation on her mind, it would probably be hard to focus on it. It should be proper enough for a meeting with a noble, you should have some fitting leather boots to go with it. This is great, when did you have time to make it? Roland started going through the box and could see himself wearing this to a meeting with a rich merchant. The fabric and leather was of high quality and while buying the materials was cheaper than buying fabricated clothing, it still had to have cost Elidia a bit. Initially he wanted to ask about the costs of those materials but he bit his tongue. It was clearly intended as a gift and if he tried to cover the cost of it all, it would just lessen the work Elidia went into. Mostly when you were out on your adventures or in the workshop, not like we have customers in the store the whole day, just something to keep my hands busy, now go wash your face. It seemed that she was intent on him getting into these clothes here and now. Lobelia and Armand were sticking closer to the orphanage now due to the problems with the merchants. While Elidia did have some more time on her hands, he would not want to keep her away from her extended family in their time of need. But while looking at Elidia's rather radiant face he decided to drop the issue. Perhaps what she needed was something to keep her mind off it, instead of a constant reminder of the deadline. While he had shared his tent idea with her beforehand, she didn't seem all that glad in taking him up on the offer. It seemed that she didn't want to abuse his goodwill and was still trying to fix her problems by herself. Thus he headed over to his bathroom to get cleaned up, regretfully he was refused when he offered to take a bat together. Elidia proved to be a tough nut to crack when it came to the one-on-one -on -one time. It didn't take him that long to clean up and after some time he was given the clothes. These really fit well, how do I look? Roland asked while looking into the mirror with Elidia next to him. He was quite surprised at just how well these clothes fit him. There was never a point where he was measured by Elidia which meant that she had to eyeball it. The tailoring skill must have worked its wonders as it was a perfect fit. He was now standing with a dark vest on and with a white shirt under it. His pants matched the vest's dark coloring, the only thing that he was missing was a tie and some shoes to go with it. Is there a problem? Elidia seemed to have gone quiet after he put on some clothes. He even attempted to style his hair into a more modern look. Now he was being stared at by his girlfriend that had gone quiet. She was clearly staring at his face with a red tint to her cheeks. Problem? Ah now but maybe it would be better to wear that robe when you go into the city. So you want me to wear my old robe? He wasn't sure what this was about as Elidia clearly agreed with him when he pointed out his lack of attire. Well what will you do if your clothes get dirty? You only have one pair and it could start raining. Raining hey. Roland nodded a bit as it was possible that he could accidentally get some dirt thrown his way. Maybe I should take the cloak instead, my hair could get messy. And no, just put the robe on. Oh uh, okay. It did seem that Elode wanted him to cover up from head to toe apparently. He wasn't sure why but there was no reason to dig into it too much. When it was an hour before the intended meeting he decided to leave his house. There were many things going through his head. At first he thought to bring up the orphanage with the Lord but this would show a big weak spot. If they were there to discuss business the Lord could prod at this issue. He could promise to take care of it only if Roland signed an unfavorable contract. It wasn't out of the picture but first, he needed to prod this Arthur Valerian for answers. What kind of person was he? What did he want to achieve here and why was he giving him this strange offer of cooperation? It didn't take him long to arrive at the auction house. It was a place that he had not visited in quite some time, even Bernier and his wife were eventually banned from attending it. Any known associates that tried to sell anything were seen as potential eyesores. He came half an hour early and it didn't seem that the Lord was quite there yet. For the time being, he decided to wait while examining the current auction house. If things went well, then perhaps he could resume his involvement with them. 
how they treated him for the past few years didn't matter to him. It was clearly just business related and he just did not have enough pull to make them bend the knee. Now on the other hand he had managed to attract the eyes of the city lord. While he still didn't like to work with or for the nobles, if it allowed him to progress and save the orphanage, he was willing to take some risks. Chapter 182, Meeting the City Lord This place looks more like the auction house in Edelgard. Roland had arrived at the meeting place half an hour early. Without anything else to do, he decided to examine the auction house that he was banned from. The first real difference he discovered was the large sign on the front of it. Previously it didn't show any affiliation with the Valyrian household but now there was an emblem of their house there, instead of the old Albrook auction house name it changed to Valyrian auction house. It seemed that this family would offer up their name that easily. Perhaps without the new noble appearing here it would still have the old naming scheme. Now, on the other hand, it was profitable enough to give it a boost by affiliating it with their brand. Having brand recognition must be nice. While looking at the sign he thought of his own little magic shop. While he tried to present his store as one with high quality wares, it wasn't that easy. His competition went out of their way to badmouth his wares and any dwarven adventurers were clearly affected by it. Even though the runes that he produced were better than the enchantments his competition was offering, a lot of people were scared. They didn't want to risk their hard-earned money into a product that didn't have a good reputation. That's why his shop's progress was slow yet somewhat steady. Most of his advertisements went through word of mouth. If he actually managed to reel in a customer, they mostly returned for more. There was just no comparison between the quality of the magic Arun could produce. Then with the added ether alloy treatment, it produced just a better product in general. He was gaining some ground but it wasn't quite enough. The wares were not flying off the shelves as he had hoped. Without money, he was not able to fuel his continuous research into his golemic creations and various weapons. Luckily whenever money was low he could always go into the dungeon and hunt for some monsters. But even with the new mining spot now accessible to him, there was always a problem with selling the better products. There was nowhere to dump the spider droids off and the black market merchants were somewhat unwilling to fork up what he was owed. The products he was offering fit more with the nobles and merchants as they were not quite the killing machines that people at the black market could use. The spider bots didn't work that well for other people that didn't have direct access to their runic software. Without a proper strategy, these would most work as mobile turrets that could give some ranged support. But even with the somewhat clunky way they worked, they still packed a punch. With enough of the spider golems casting attacking spells, any tier 2 monster would go down eventually. They also ran on mana fluid that was replaceable. They were like portable mages that could be placed at certain locations. He could imagine one adventurer just luring a larger monster into a trap where his golem spammed it with multiple elemental arrow spells. The problem lied in convincing people that it was a worthy investment over any other magic weapon. This he hoped to achieve by having it be auctioned off to people that could actually afford it. He would have to improve on the design a bit further but he was confident in making a valid prototype that could be used by anyone. Getting a bit ahead of myself here, first I need to hear this noble out. Roland gave out a sigh while standing there and waiting. The motives of this person called Arthur Valerian were unknown to him. The most obvious turn of events would be that he would be given some unfavorable contract. Then there would be the worst case scenario where the noble was already working together with his enemies. He could be offered two options to either work under the Dwarven Union or get kicked out of the city instead. The city lord could crush his business in various ways, one of them would be similar to what was happening to the orphanage. They could accuse him of performing various acts of dangerous witchcraft. If there was a priest that could be bought out, they could testify that he was some kind of demon worshipper. Evil warlocks like the one he ran into all those years before were deemed as enemies of Solaria. They were hunted down by the church and seen as criminals for signing contracts with evil deities or demons. While his imagination raged on, time passed. The more he waited the more anxious he became, then he even noticed that there were people looking in his direction. 
Before panicking he realized that for some reason all of the people staring at him were women. Old ones, young ones, and the in-between. It seemed that they were staring his way after he had disrobed. His face and more fashionable clothes were now on display. At this point he realized that they were not people out to hurt him, no they were clearly staring at him without malicious intent. Oh was this why Lydia didn't want me to take this robe off before I entered the auction house? It seemed that his new girlfriend was feeling threatened. Roland was aware that he was quite handsome and his charisma stat had gone up over the average a few years ago. Most of his time was spent in the dungeon or working in his workshop so he didn't really have time to mingle with other people. Now after enhancing his looks with better clothes and somewhat styled hair, he was clearly attracting more eyes. Luckily for Elidia Roland did not have any intention of using his newfound good looks to cheat. To him, such things were far too troublesome and he quite liked his current situation with a woman that could actually aid him in his ventures. What time is it? Should I go ask one of the guards? Noon was quick approaching and Roland glanced towards the auction house. There were many guards all over the place and several entrances. One for the customers, another one for the sellers and another one for the people working there. Before he could go and ask, he noticed a certain out-of-place cat girl walking out of the entrance used for workers. Her red cat ears were on display and they somewhat clashed with the maid uniform that she was wearing. The girl was quite the sight for sore eyes and a head-turner. But her beauty was not the only attribute that Roland noticed. There was something in the way she was walking, then there was also the fact that he could not examine her status. Either she has some kind of analyzing blocking skill or a magical item like me. Around Roland's neck was still the item that he received from his old boss. When he was there he didn't realize but this thing was quite high quality. Only a person at tier 3 with an evolved analyzing skill would be able to see past it. Welcome, you must be Mr. Wayland. Lord Arthur is waiting for you, please follow me. She was quick to pick him out of the people standing there. He had never seen her before but for some reason, she was informed about his appearance. The worst thing about this visit was that he could not bring any weapons with him. At first, he thought about bringing something small like a ring with a simple attacking spell. But if it was discovered by the Lord's guards he would be quickly sent to jail for attempted murder. He didn't like it but for the time being, he would have to get through this without wearing any extra equipment. This puts my class in perspective. His class of runesmith lord might have given him battle strength over most tier 2 classes but it had a huge weakness. This was of course that without proper preparations and equipment he lacked most means of protecting himself. Even though his raw stats might be above people of the same level, he lacked any battle skills that those classes had. Someone like Armand could reinforce his fists with certain skills to become hard as metal, in a direct exchange Roland would probably not fare too well. Roland nodded at the cat girl's question and followed behind her towards the worker's entrance. Some of the guards looked at them with narrowed eyes, it seemed that they wanted to say something but couldn't. Haven't seen this place in a while. Soon they were on the inside, he had been here before the whole Dwarven Union debacle. The entrance for the cellars was quite close to this one and they shared the same corridor. Not far from this spot he could see the entrance to the room where he received some payments for his limited wares. Roland had not spent much time here though, his contract with the guild was quite swift. For quite some time he unloaded his wares there and just came to pick up the coins later. The maid turned to one side and the journey continued. His opinion of the maid started to increase as he noticed that she was not making any sound as she moved. Her whole demeanor was like a sharpened sword and for some reason, he was reminded of a certain elf lady from his days in Edelgard. The woman was clearly not a simple maid but an actual threat to his life. Her status was hidden so he was not aware if she was above him in levels. Without his equipment, he was not able to measure her threat value which just increased the tension. Soon they passed through more corridors and from the corner of his eye he could even see part of the auction house stage. At this time it was still closed but he noticed that the workers were preparing for tonight's auction already. Items were being organized by Worth and then shipped to the correct stage. This auction house only had two sections, 
one for the more costly items and another for the ones meant for people with less money. Both of them were about the same size but the one that involved the rich merchants would clearly look better. If he ever was allowed to sell, here again, he would probably target this more exclusive auction stage. After another flight of stairs, they finally arrived at what looked to be the manager's office. The first thing that he noticed were two men dressed in bulky armor. They were clearly knights and this time around his analyzing skill did work. Name Gareth Astast L91 Class Sword Knight L41 Name Morian Hartmond L90 Class Spear Knight L40 Roland didn't even bother looking through their Tier 1 classes and focused on what was important. They weren't that strong, there were many silver-ranked adventurers and old retired veterans that reached these heights. They both looked to be in their twenties so they still had some time to improve. Please wait here, I'll inform the Lord of your coming. The maid ventured forward while he was left with these two people. Both of them were giving him the stink eye but not like they could intimidate him after he knew their levels. There was a large gap between them, even without his armor he was confident in being able to overpower these two or at least make a run for it. Both of the guards had last names, this indicated that they belonged to some kind of noble line. Arthur Valerian was still related to the duke's household so it was normal for him to have retainers from noble houses at a lower standing. The house names didn't ring a bell so it meant that the two didn't hail from any important family. The Lord will see you now but first we will need to perform a search, I hope Mr. Wayland understands. The maid walked out after a minute and informed him that he would need to get padded down. This was expected and the reason why he decided to leave all magical items at home. If it was him from a few years ago, this would probably be the time where he declined the offer. Now, on the other hand, he had learned to put some trust into others and not presume that everyone was out to get him. That's fine. I expected this much. Mary smiled and then turned her face to one of the guards. The man named Morian moved in after getting the search order. He was shorter than Roland by half a head but his frame was slightly wider. His chestnut hair and a balding patch at the back of the head became visible the moment he walked over. Roland didn't resist, his new clothes didn't have any pockets as Elidia probably didn't have any time to add any. After a quick pat down it seemed that he was free to go but as soon as the knight stepped back the maid got involved. Mr. Wayland, that pendant could you take it off? It seemed that this maid was up to something. The two knights didn't say anything but Roland was not fine with revealing his status screen to people he didn't know. This was not included in the letter, I'm sure you know what this is used for, I would like to keep my status out of this. You dare to go against the Lord's wishes. This time around it was the man called Gareth, he was closer to Roland's height but thinner. It didn't seem that the knight liked Roland's tone or choice of words. Due to his modern-day roots and also him being an actual noble, he did seem to interact with these aristocrats in a more casual way. No, but I would like to keep some things private, I can offer you my adventurer card, you'll find all the information you want there. This type of situation was something that he was expecting. Thus the only identification that proved who he was, was his adventurer card. The people here didn't need to know that it was created without people actually peeking in on his full status screen. Mary the maid raised her hand which for some reason caused the angry guard to be quiet. She reached out her small hand towards the card that Roland was holding and then vanished inside of the room. After a short moment, she poked her head out with an answer. The Lord says that it's fine you may come in now. This maid knew what kind of magical item this pendant was. It was clearly not hazardous to the man that was waiting for him inside this office. Finally, it was time to meet the Lord, surprisingly the two guards wouldn't be taking part in this meeting. Instead, the maid remained, it was clear that she was also a combatant, probably stronger than the two guards. Good day Mr. Wayland I must apologize for my guards, they are just trying to do their duty in protecting their lord. It was quite a surprise when Roland heard the first sentence. An actual noble apologized for his retainers that were rude to him. 
normally they would only double down or berate the common folk for taking up their precious time. The person named Arthur was sitting behind a large desk, behind him was a large window. It was somewhat tinted but through it he could see down to the auction house main stage. Some of the workers were shuffling around even as the noble was speaking. This office had a clear view over the whole stage and the people sitting there. But the people on the other side probably couldn't look into it. Roland recognized the tinted dark glass, it was magical in nature and made from special material. I thank the Lord for his gracious words and understanding of my situation. Roland on the other hand replied in a cordial fashion while bowing his head. It had been some time since he interacted with a proper noble. His manners were a bit rusty but thanks to his current identity the noble would probably let it slide if he did something wrong. Please sit down, we have many topics to discuss. Arthur pointed to the chair opposite to him and Roland just nodded. It was time for the meeting to finally take place. Ah yes, Mary. Bring it out. Yes my lord. As he was sitting down the maid opened up a side door that looked to be a closet. From it, she took out something familiar and placed it on the middle of the desk. It was the spider golem that he had gifted the noble and probably the sole reason that he was here. I have received your gift Mr. Wayland and it was quite the fascinating one indeed. The instruction manual that you have created was a nice touch but I won't bore you with empty praises. I'm sure you are a busy man, so instead, I would like to make you an offer. An offer? Yes, become mine. Um become yours, my lord. Roland quickly replied while looking at the noble named Arthur. For some reason, he was staring directly into his eyes with a somewhat strange look. Wait am I in danger? Chapter 183, Strange Noble Cough Mary covered her mouth with her hand while giving out an obvious fake coughing sound. Arthur looked to her and then back to Roland that had a confused look on his face. It took a few seconds for it to click but soon he did realize that he picked the wrong words. Ah, by mine I meant that I wish you to become one of my retainers, of course. Arthur turned his head to the side. Roland could clearly see the young man blushing after making an awkward comment. While for any normal person being given an opportunity to work for a noble as a proper retainer was a big deal, for Roland it would not be anything that he desired. The whole reason that he left the Arden estate was to be self-sufficient. Even in his previous life, he bounced around because of the whims of others. Parents, teachers, perhaps even the society that he was in, he felt as if he just followed a paved road that others just told him to tread on. But as much as he wanted to refuse instantly he suppressed this urge. Arthur might have asked him to become a follower but this didn't mean that he would be something similar to the maid or the guards outside. Instead, he could just be something more like an exclusive blacksmith that gains some rewards for prioritizing his lord's orders. Thus before he could make a decision, he needed to figure out the details of this deal. Roland had already gone through several contracts and was not against signing others depending on the deal. By this point in his life, he had already come to terms with this part of this world. You wish me to become one of your servants? In short, yes but not quite what I had in mind, let me clarify. First of all, I'm aware of the problems you have faced, the dwarves and merchants must not have made it easy to survive in this city. But, even though they have tried you have managed to claw your way up. Roland looked to the noble that turned away from him and started monologuing about his achievements. It seemed that Arthur Valerian was impressed with what he was able to do in this short amount of time. And then there is this golem, it would be very disheartening if such a talented craftsman like you would be able to reach his full potential, thus I am willing to offer you an opportunity Mr. Wayland, become my personal blacksmith. Personal blacksmith. Roland parroted the statement of the Lord as everything was moving fast. He was somewhat expecting to get some kind of offer but becoming the main smith of a Lord was not that simple. It carried a degree of responsibility towards that noble, in some cases, these craftsmen could be accused of purposely making faulty equipment which could spell death for them. If he was responsible for making some personal weapons, he would be also responsible if they broke during battle. 
even if it broke for good reasons some nobles would take out their rage on these craftsmen, punishing them in various ways. So, while the title would probably be quite the boost to his prestige in the city, it would also carry with it some drawbacks. Oh, is it such a surprise, or are you dissatisfied with the offer? Arthur asked while also looking away from the magical glass that was showing him the auction house beneath. It would be somewhat rude for Roland to turn down the offer, thus he was not sure what he should do now. The person here could make things really difficult for him if their relationship turned sour. Well, my lord. Speak freely, I can clearly tell that you have some reservations, I would not force the position upon you. I realize that working for such an insignificant noble like me might not be something that such a young and aspiring runesmith would want to do. Uh, my lord. Roland raised his brow while looking at Arthur that for some reason was commenting about his own low birth. While he knew that the noble was probably a bastard son that was sent here to get rid of, it wasn't confirmed before he spoke out. Lord Arthur, why did... The car girl that was listening on the side raised her voice after hearing the insignificant part. She quickly stopped as Arthur raised his hand up though. It's fine Mary, I'm not looking for mindless lackeys, it's best if Mr. Wayland knows what he is getting himself into. Roland just looked between the two while not saying anything, during this whole conversation he wasn't really able to give much of his own input. It did seem that this young man valued Roland quite a bit and the only reason that he could come up with, was a lack of power. Perhaps the one with the leverage here was not the Lord but him instead. While the noble continued to talk Roland noticed some oddities in his tone and mannerisms. Arthur seemed somewhat nervous when he tried to ask some questions and for some reason, he was being overly truthful. At first, it looked like it would be some kind of negotiation between them but suddenly the young man dropped the noble act. It was as if he wasn't looking for an employee but a partner instead. It also didn't seem as if this noble had a good opinion of himself as he continued to talk down about his own standing. He was somewhat getting emotional as well, it was as if Roland was a piece of wood that he was trying to cling to after his ship had sunk. Excuse me my lord can I be frank? Finally. Roland gathered up some courage after hearing the man blunder about without getting to the point of it all. After the question, Arthur just nodded his head before he finally sat back down on his chair. Please go ahead. I am not interested in becoming a part of any noble house. I am still in training, I'm also part of the Adventurers Guild which does take up much of my time, I don't think I would be able to continue bettering my craft if I settle down as a personal blacksmith. Roland replied quickly, for normal craftsmen it was probably the ticket out of poverty. The nobles would supply them with materials and they could just craft away while progressing further with their craft. Bettering himself as a runesmith was only a part of his future plans, this also included gaining levels and being able to protect himself from others with his own two hands. For that, he needed to fight monsters and create new items for that purpose. But I am willing to hear your offer. I'm sure we can work something out. The Lord already knows my situation with the dwarves and how they organized my removal from this auction house. Arthur nodded. Ah, yes the dwarves, of course, you will be free to present your wares to the public at my auction house, I wanted to save it for later but it does seem that you have made up your mind Mr. Wayland. Arthur moved his hand towards his desk and brought out a small stack of papers. At first, Roland thought it was just another contract but after seeing the first page he noticed that it wasn't his name that was on it, but it was Elidia's. I see that you are surprised, I hope that it won't sour our relationship but my people have looked into your personal matters. These are papers for the orphanage. What he was looking at now were documents that stated that Elidia could keep the orphanage that she had bought a couple of years ago. Yes. The city official that signed off on the inspection has been removed from his position, he had been clearly taking bribes and didn't cover his tracks well enough. This wasn't all as besides them he also received a permit to sell items in the auction house. There was even a special card that was similar to the adventurer card which would give him some special privileges. Is this a golden supplier card? I see that I won't need to explain then, yes this was part of the offerings I wished to hand to you Mr. Wayland. 
The golden supplier card opened up the auction house to anyone having it. People with it wouldn't need to bother with waiting in line, they could drop off their wares whenever they wanted. They would also pay smaller fees for their wares which sometimes went up to 30%. Now with those two gifts presented Roland wasn't sure what to do. Would Arthur snatch them away, he really wanted to help Elidia with the orphanage. If he stayed on Arthur's bad side he could easily reinstate the old inspector and do the whole thing again. But if he joined him, the merchants in the city would probably get the message that Roland had some backing. While he couldn't force them to sell materials to him directly, he could indirectly pressure them in other ways. Just like that, one city official gave a bogus inspection to Elidia's orphanage, so could he order the same. The dwarves might find themselves with their materials being held up for many weeks by the guards. Normally a city lord would not go against the dwarven union as they were paying a lot in tax money. But if he could somewhat replace them with his own people, then he would. Back in Edelgard, there was one bloodthirsty noble in particular that went with that option. You have my thanks but I'm not sure if I can just accept these. Nonsense, I insist. You would give me these? But I already refused your main offer. I see it more as an investment, I'm sure with time you will see it my way, Mr. Wayland. My lord you are very... Roland stopped himself before continuing but Arthur decided to finish the sentence. Generous. No, naive. He somewhat quickly blurred out what he was thinking. The noble was investing in someone like him without any contracts or promises. This would normally spell disaster, there was nothing keeping Roland from moving out of the city. How dare you? After blurting out the word the cat made that was to the side raised her voice. Roland turned his head to the side to eyeball her as it seemed that she could attack him at any moment. But before a brawl ensued the two heard a joyous laugh coming from behind the desk. Ha ha ha, naive he said. I think I like you even more Mr. Wayland, are you sure you don't want to reconsider? I can't offer you much in money but I can lower the margins for any auctions you take part in. It seemed that he wasn't offended, which was good for him. Did you work for a noble before? You don't seem intimidated by my name at all, the way you conduct yourself is also peculiar. While Roland was noticing elements about Arthur, he was doing the same to him. Roland was brought up in the modern world and also in the Arden estate. He did not conduct himself as a commoner that would probably be panicking at this moment if they were in his shoes. Ah well, I apologize for being rude. He performed an awkward bow but this only made Arthur burst out in laughter even more. The maid that was on the side seemed to do the same as they both started laughing together. Does this guy have a screw loose or something? It seems that instead of a runesmith he is looking for a friend or something, I don't get it. If Arthur wanted to make a good impression on a potential retainer he had failed miserably. He was talking in a casual way and also just gave out the only bargaining chips that he had. Normally he should have made Roland sign a contract before giving him the papers for the orphanage. Well, I don't feel like he is lying to me at least. The person he was talking to was behaving strangely but this only made him seem more genuine. Was Arthur just good at acting and was hiding some kind of ploy that he would regret in the future? As I said before, I'm open to doing business with you my lord, if you wish I will treat you as a priority customer. Priority customer. Arthur rubbed his chin while thinking before slamming his hand down on the desk. I guess that will have to do, for now, I'm sure you'll come around soon enough. Now, let us talk business, Mr. Wayland. It seemed that even though he had refused the proposal, Arthur Valerian was still willing to do business with him. This meant that he would keep the auction house privileges and also get the legal papers for Elidia. In return, he would be getting a new business partner that would probably ask him for some favors. What ensued after was just regular business talk between the two men. Arthur was mostly interested in presenting Roland's golems on display. In his mind, this was the most unique product that he could offer and he wanted to maximize on the monetary gain. Thus I would like to propose this divide. After some back and forth they agreed on a certain percentage. During the conversation, 
Roland was sure to mention his displeasure in the merchant's way of dealing with him. He did not mention that he was getting his materials from the thieves' guild but even without asking, Arthur probably had a suspicion. This was somewhat dangerous, Roland didn't really save much money on buying from the black market but the city lost money in untaxable wares. If this was known, he would quickly be thrown into jail. Luckily his new associate was willing to help him out with that. I don't think that would be a problem, Mary. Yes my lord. Mr. Wayland, this is Mary, my personal maid, if you give her a list of the goods you require she will be able to get them for you, of course you'll cover the cost of the transaction. It was a very simple solution. While Arthur could potentially threaten the merchants into selling to Roland, there was no need to. Instead he could use Mary as a middleman. The merchants would not be able to deny services to the Lord's personal maid, even if they knew that she was just dumping off everything at Roland's house instantly after. Isn't this deal somewhat one-sided? After everything was said and done, Roland asked this question. When something seemed too good to be true, it mostly was. Either he was getting himself into something that could backfire dramatically or he was receiving a deal of his lifetime. Even after refusing the main request of becoming the Lord's retainer, he was still getting all the things that he wanted. Access to the auction house, the right to Elidia's orphanage, and being able to receive materials at the market price through Mary's help. There were also no binding contracts prepared, Arthur was just giving out gifts that were almost free. Not like he wouldn't be working and creating more items either way, now he just had a better venue that could probably gain him more money and prestige. It might seem one-sided to you, Wayland but I think I'm a good judge of character. Arthur just smiled while Roland was handed the paperwork. The meeting was over and for the time being, they agreed on helping Roland present some runic items when he was ready. He needed some time to figure out what the best model to sell would be as he would be opening himself up to a new market. Is that so, well then I'll see you when I have the prototype ready. With no binding contracts, Roland had ample time to work. But, even though the promise was made with words he intended to work diligently with this new noble. This was his chance to finally stick it to the dwarves and after three years of being kicked around by them, he was eager to outstage them. That didn't go as well as I hoped for Lord Arthur, are you sure we can trust him? I did prepare a proper contract. After Roland left, Mary and Arthur were left alone in the room. The plan was to convince the runesmith into signing a contract with them, but for some reason, Arthur decided to go off script. Didn't you notice? That man is hiding it well but I'm sure of it. Hiding something? No what is it? Ha <laughs> ha. Well it doesn't matter, I'm sure he will deliver on his part of the agreement. Arthur shrugged while walking back to the magical mirror, from it he continued to stare at the beginning of a new auction with a faint smile covering his face. Chapter 184, Secrets What is this? What does it look like? I mean how did you get it? What did that noble ask you to do? Did you sign a contract? I we could have found a different way. Why did you have to? Wait, calm down, why are you crying? I didn't sign any contracts, just wait and let me explain. Roland was back home, the nice looking vest was off and he had returned to wearing some loose clothes around his home. After the conversation with the city lord, he returned to his home where Elidia was waiting for him. Thus after relieving himself of the new clothes he handed her the orphanage papers that he received. This of course caused a misunderstanding in which she believed that he sold himself to the new lord. It took some time to explain that the man named Arthur Valerian wasn't like most of the other nobles. I'm not sure I understand the new lord but he might just be a better person than we expected. It does seem that way but I wouldn't be surprised if there was another reason for it. Roland commented as he wasn't quite convinced. There could be various reasons why he decided not to use a contract. Maybe he wanted there to not be any paper trails to lead back to him. Do you think they could be problems? Oh my, do you think he is doing something illegal and needs someone to be a scapegoat? That's a possibility but I'm not sure, he didn't give me the impression of being the evil plotter type. 
he shrugged as from what he knew, the new noble really didn't have much pull in the city just yet. At most he could control the auction house and help him get materials. If he tried to strong-arm too many people, the rich merchants could use some of their contacts to get revenge. While he was dealing with commoners, they were rich commoners. Some of the merchants were in a better state than other nobles. They could probably pay some of them off to cause some trouble for Arthur in the future. After living in the Arden estate for five years and reading up he heard about a few incidents. In those, some nobles caused incidents where they challenged others to duels for no reason. Then later they were given a costly gift from a rich merchant that the other noble insulted. By the size of Arthur's entourage, it didn't seem that he had much pull in his own house. The name Valerian carried a lot of weight behind it, but only if it belonged to a proper heir or part of the family. If it was one of the bastard sons, they wouldn't be taken as seriously. What do you think his real intentions are? I'm not sure, normally if he wanted to gain power and prestige he should have gone to the union or the rich merchants. He could easily make their life easier while funneling some money towards himself. For Roland, it made sense to stick to the corrupt ways of the nobles. He could easily accept bribes while slowly increasing the wealth of the merchants in the city. On the other hand if he really wants to own this city, he would need to get rid of them all, or at least make them work for him. Elidia nodded, the city belonged to the rich. Even though Arthur was the acting lord, he could be replaced. He wasn't much more than a bona fide tax collector and judge. The real power belonged to the Valyrian household that he didn't seem to get along with. Though I'm not sure how he can go about this, a good way would be to find evidence of their hidden deals, if they evaded taxes in any way, it would be within his right as the city lord to apprehend them but even then, he could just put away one figurehead while another one pops up to take over the business from outside. Roland gave out a sigh before sinking back into the couch. Even though it wasn't that late, he was feeling tired. The discussion with the noble went better than he could ever expect but he wasn't sure what the future held. This might be over for now but I think we should prepare. Prepare? Asked Elidia while looking at Roland that he had some concern in his tone. Yes, we will have to look into other options, maybe find a better location for the children, aren't some of them already working? Maybe we could find them an apprenticeship where they could live. Roland's biggest concern now was to get rid of this problem. Even though Arthur helped him out this time, it was easy to make another bogus inspection paper to kick them out again. Some of the kids were older and could work. It wasn't strange for younger kids to live together with a master that taught them their craft. They would assist them in their work while being given valuable experience and also food. He went through a similar experience back in Edelgard but there he was offered his own small home. We. While Roland was slowly blurring out words, Elidia cut him off as he didn't realize that he was implying that both of them were working together. Did I say something wrong? He asked as he wasn't sure what the problem was. At this point, it should already be obvious what his intentions towards her were. Would he be taking sketchy papers from an unknown noble to help her out, if he wasn't at least somewhat serious about her? Did you think I'd kick you out or something? At this point, Roland chuckled while placing his hand on top of Elidia's head, this of course caused the woman to blush. But aren't you worried that you are wasting your time and money with me? She answered while lowering her gaze down, it was clear that she didn't want to ask for help and felt bad about dragging Roland into this. Wasting money and time? Well, I guess then we can waste it, together. While had made his decision about Elidia, he was not that keen about becoming a stepfather to so many orphans. Instead, his plan was to find them jobs after they reach a certain age. They could even work here as long as they wouldn't live at his house where he needed to have his own space. That being said, there was a stray thought that appeared in Roland's mind. While he might have made his decision to go forward along with Elidia, he wasn't telling her the whole truth. She was not aware of his past roots, if he really wanted to continue this relationship he felt that he needed to fess up. Elidia I need to tell you something, you might want to sit down. He wasn't sure why but he felt that if he continued to lie about his origins, 
that sooner or later something bad would happen. After spending so much time in this city, he became more comfortable with people around him, thus he would be inclined to stay true. Oh? Is something wrong? It was clear that the lady with glasses was confused as the atmosphere quickly changed. Roland leaned forward from the couch to press his palm against each other while remaining silent. He was deeply in thought and somewhat scared about pronouncing his origins but sooner or later it needed to be said. At this point, he trusted Elidia to not pronounce his secret to the world. Not many people would actually believe that he was a noble. This information was probably more detrimental to his enemies, as they would now have to deal with blemishing the name of a noble. Even though the Arden estate wasn't that known, it would be enough to throw them into jail. You probably have already noticed that I always wear this thing around my neck, even when we are around the house. The necklace that he was given by his gnome boss back in Edelgard was constantly around his neck. Even during his sleep. He kept it there out of fear that someone would examine his status and find out that he had a last name. Instead of pronouncing his real name, he removed the trinket from around his neck and placed it on the table. Go ahead, examine my status, those glasses should be powerful enough. Elidia looked at the item that was always around Roland's neck. It wasn't a secret that he was hiding something and she somewhat learned to ignore this part of him, but the curiosity never did die down. Her knee-jerk reaction was to tell Roland to just put it back on if he didn't feel comfortable with it. He on the other hand just looked at her very seriously, it was clear that he wanted her to proceed. It wasn't like she wasn't interested either, there had been many times that she questioned his origins but as she had somewhat of a past herself, she didn't ask. With the help of her glasses, she looked at him and used a pinch of mana to activate their effect. They momentarily started to glow with a blue hue as they presented the stats to her. Finally, she was able to see his full status screen and instantly she realized that the man that she used to call Wayland, wasn't Wayland at all. Roland. Yes, that's my real name but I'm sure that you noticed. Roland Arden. She repeated his name again but this time it was the full one. Only certain people in this world possessed last names and they mostly belonged to one group, the nobles. Even rich merchants didn't have them, it was a title given to the special. It was clear that now she knew that he wasn't what he said he was. Um is that it? Elidia asked while looking at Roland's confused face. Instead of asking questions, she didn't seem to perturbed by the fact that her boyfriend was lying about his real name. Wait aren't you mad? Why should I be mad? Doesn't take a genius to realize that you were using an alias Roland that's a nice name, much better than Wayland to be honest. She just shrugged while complimenting Roland on his true name. Roland on the other hand felt like he wanted to crawl under his bed for stressing himself out for no reason. You did behave more like a son of a rich merchant or a noble or are you perhaps from some kind of knight order? I okay, let me explain. It seemed that Elidia had somewhat figured out that he was keeping a secret from everyone. As they continued to speak she revealed to him that he didn't behave like a regular commoner which made her suspicious. There was a certain fear that the commoners had towards people of noble birth. They were taught to feel inadequate compared to them and it was clear that Roland didn't act that way. He had no problem with talking with nobles and when he did, it looked somewhat strange as if he was constantly restraining himself. Roland didn't want to beat around the bush so in short, he described his life. From the five years that he spent at the Arden estate to his arrival here. He didn't forget to include the details about the cult that he once had a run in. But after so many years of them never showing up they weren't considered a threat anymore. Elidia didn't comment and continued to listen, probably if she had a bag with popcorn it would have been all eaten when he was finished with the story. I'm not sure what to say. I thought you'd be more surprised but you already figured out some parts by yourself, you're too smart for your own good. He smiled while looking at Elidia that was now sitting right next to him on the couch. From the looks of things, it didn't look that she was as shocked as he expected. This played out differently in his mind, he was even expecting her to raise her voice after realizing that he was lying to her for all these years. I didn't think that you'd be a runaway noble 
at most a member of a fallen knight family. She chuckled while looking at him, it was clear that she wasn't mad at all. It wasn't that rare to find people from disgraced knight families, they also possessed last names and mostly came over to the Adventurers Guild to seek employment. But you certainly were daring in your younger days, I can't imagine running away from home at ten, was it really that bad? Well. To be frank, from Roland's standpoint, no normal person would choose his way of living. Being sent to the Knight Academy was far better than living out on the streets as he did. A position in the army was guaranteed and if he was a noble's son he might have even been stationed somewhere safe. The world was already filled with many dangers, being a soldier wasn't considered more dangerous than being an adventurer. I didn't expect this, I thought you'd be madder for me lying. Elidia smiled but then seemed to pause for a second before answering. Everyone has their secrets, even I have things that... It seemed that she was also hiding something but just like she saw through him, so did he. It was somewhat strange to be opening an orphanage in a city like Albrook. When he arrived, Elidia was already living here but it was clear that they arrived at a later date. He didn't want to pry into her business but it looked that now after he had shared his secret, it was time for her. It isn't anything spectacular like being a runaway noble but... It's fine, you don't have to tell me if you don't want to. The moment she started speaking Roland could see some amount of shaking. It was as if she was scared to divulge information about her circumstances. No, you were truthful with me, I need to also be sincere. Apparently, she made up her mind, with a sigh escaping her mouth she finally faced the man in front of her and told the tale of her younger days. There was not much behind it, she had no glorious background as he did, it was the reverse she was one of the many orphans roaming the cities. Along with Armand and Lobelia, they spent their days out on the streets. They all lived together at one of the church buildings more on the mainland. The moment Elidia started mentioning her old living condition he did notice her slow down, soon enough he would realize what it was about. The priest did. Regretfully so, he was quite the strong believer in the doctrine, he would punish us regularly if any of the children weren't able to articulate the passages from the scriptures well. The main priest responsible for the church was apparently very pedantic about how the kids should be brought up. Sometimes they spent days out in the rain as punishment, with no food to fill their bellies. But it wasn't all bad, the three siblings stuck with each other from a young age. Armand started out adventuring at the young age of twelve and Lobelia followed him soon after. Elidia remained in the orphanage while also trying to look for some work but then when the incident occurred. He tried to do what? Roland found himself raising his voice as Elidia continued to tell her story. The older they got, the more aggressive the punishments became. Armand took the brunt of them but when he started his adventurer journey, the caregiver turned his rage towards the other kids. On one faithful day, it was Elidia's turn. But this time around, he attempted to go further than usual and attempted to force himself on her instead. It's fine, nothing happened, he wasn't able to continue but that's also the day that everything changed. As the story continued he was finally given the answer to why they were here. Apparently, during the attempted assault, Armand showed up after completing a mission together with Lobelia. They were already somewhat older at this point at 14. They were close to an age where they could leave the church shelter altogether. The priest was beaten up to a bloody pulp after which they had to run. Even though the man was a failure of a cleric, he was part of the Sun Church. If they were caught, they would get into trouble. They quickly packed up their things and escaped along with some of the other children from that orphanage. Then they traveled through the kingdom and finally ended up in Albrook with even more kids in tow. I see. So that's what happened, you didn't have it easy. Roland commented but Elidia shook her head instead as she responded. What about you? I can't imagine traveling all by myself. He just shrugged and with a smile on his face replied. Hey, well I guess we are good at running away from our problems. Soon the room they were in was covered with silence which was only broken by a large howl outside of the door. 
Roland was just about to wrap his arms around his partner but it seemed that his ruby wolf was tired of sitting outside. Even when he tried to ignore him, the howls and barking soon changed into door scratching, it was clear that he wanted in and wouldn't take a no for an answer. Damn it Agni! Roland rolled his eyes while Elidia laughed out loud, soon he was forced to open the door to only get pounced on by his overly happy tamed monster. Stop licking my face! A woo! Replied Agni while jumping off and homing in on Elidia, it seemed that the licking was not yet over and soon one more person would find their face moistened up. Noel. Chapter 185, Blasting Away Roland rolled over to the side and looked at an unoccupied pillow. This was something that he had gotten only due to Elidia as from time to time she stayed for the night. Without her around it looked out of place but it reminded him of the previous couple of days. Finally, after all these years he had managed to reveal his big secret to someone. This time without it being forceful like with his older brother Robert. To his surprise his partner had a little tale of her own, while it wasn't as dramatic as his, she was still shaken up by it. From what he could tell, the priest that Armand did a number on was probably alive. They left him beaten and bloody there but he did possess a tier 2 class. Thankfully Armand managed to get a drop on the priest that wasn't a very physical class. But they would probably face some charges if they were ever spotted in the region this incident happened. Elidia apparently did some digging into the issue after gaining the Adventurer Guild position. To her knowledge, there was no wanted poster issued for her OR for the others that came with her. There could be various reasons for that, one would be that the priest survived or that the guards didn't bother with it. They all came from a bad neighborhood, it wouldn't be strange if they just ignored the issue altogether. Thus, for the most part, none of them were expecting their past to bite them in the behind. Supposedly Armand even proposed to check their old town of origin out if he ever got a job close to that area. Elidia being Elidia, of course, thought that was a terrible idea, if the priest was alive and recognized Armand he could get into a heap of trouble. Roland had to agree with her. It would also be unwise to put a reconnaissance mission in Armand's hands. Knowing Armand he'd just attack a different priest. I think I have grown sentimental these past years. Normally Roland would not care if something happened to Armand but for one reason or another, the big idiot started growing on him. The two also managed to talk to each other without a fight almost breaking out. That's enough moping around, I have work to do. After a quick roll to the side, he decided to finally get up. A busy day of crafting was before him as this would probably be the last time he was using the old smelter. Everything was ready and most of the work had been done. Now without the orphanage problem looming over his head, he could think about other more pressing issues. Morning boss. Morning Bernier, hope you won't be passing out today, I intend this to be the last time. Roland replied to Bernier that had recovered since passing out from heat stroke. He and his large wife were ready to do some work. My heat and fire resistance has gone up, you don't have to worry about me boss. Bernier flexed his biceps while puffing out his chest. Diana that was to his side rolled her eyes while pinching some of that belly fat that was on her hubby. It would be nice to not have to carry your passed out body for once, think you need to stop drinking so much you are getting fat. Roland smiled slightly while watching the antics of these two. After the pinch Bernier was quite combative for once, he really did love drinking that was for sure. How could you even mention taking away my favorite pastime, don't you have any love for your handsome husband? Okay you two, save this pillow talk for your own home, let us go to work. While it was an interesting exchange between a married couple, there were more important things to do. After being rushed by their boss the two could not complain and they all spent the remainder of the day in the workshop. This time around they were finally able to add the finishing touches to the new forge and smelter. Both of the new creations were made from ether durasteel with a pinch of red mithril. This combination would allow Roland to even work with actual mithril if he so desired. Finally it's done, I guess your resistance did go up but we also spent less time. It was finally over, both his assistant and his wife were on the side. 
even though they were both covered with sweat they had smiles on their faces. Just like him, they were craftsmen and for people like them, there was nothing better than seeing your creations take shape. This calls for a toast. Of course, Bernier was quick to propose a bout of drinking but for Roland, this wasn't the end but the beginning. With the new forge and smelter now operational he could finally start improving his weapons. Then there was the deal that he made with Arthur Valerian. While he had informed the young lord that it would take some time for him to fashion a worthy prototype he couldn't wait too long. There was no contract between them so Arthur could pull back his support at any moment. At minimum, he had to fashion a golem that would be worthy of the lord's name. If he just pushed forward an inferior product his new backer could decide to make it hard for him. He was also itching to see how much gold the merchants in the city would be willing to spend for one of his creations. Then there was the last and perhaps the most important issue, the secret chamber in the dungeon. The materials that he had unearthed from there were slowly running out. Most of it went to the new magic smelter and forge. Part of it he had to sell off to the black market as he needed money for other things. I'd like to present a spider drone for the auction house, one made from ether durasteel. The current deep steel models aren't very resistant, with some of that ethereum I gathered, I'll be able to improve on the magical output and they should be far more responsive to any commands. The biggest problem with his current drones was that he designed them for himself. No one could just access the runic programs via their skills as he could. The magical machines needed to be able to perform specific commands. Luckily for him, there were some basic golem directives that he had gone through his years of research. In about a month's time, he believed that he could produce a golemic product that would be fit for the masses. Thus it was time to work, even though Roland wasn't given a proper deadline he knew that making his new ally wait would not be wise. Mary the maid would also be given some tasks to procure some products from the merchants. He was unable to create everything himself even with the ores from the dungeon. Days turned to weeks as he continued to slave away at his workshop. Most would not believe that he was someone in the graces of the city lord as he worked as if his life depended on it. This was all done so that he would be able to quickly get back into the dungeon below. While his resources were not quite as low yet, Something else lingered in his mind. The secret chamber was hidden behind that wall and the tier 3 monster that he saw there. If he was able to kill the monsters roaming that other dungeon, he would be able to quickly level up again. With higher levels came better skills and more strength that he needed. In his mind, unless he attained tier 3 he would continue to feel restless. You wanted to see me, boss. Yes, is everyone here? Great. Wait a moment, I wanted to show you something. After some days had passed Roland had managed to repair all of the spider drones along with the mule golem. Everything was almost ready for his second expedition where he intended to not only gather materials. Before leaving though, he designed a few new toys for his assistant and others. Bernier, Elidia, and even Diana were here. They were all gathered in Roland's underground workshop where he usually tested his long-ranged weaponry. At the end of it by the wall, there were some targets made from wood. They had vague human shapes and a few circles drawn on here and there to serve as targets. Is that some kind of new wand? Why is it so big and why does it have that cylinder on the side? All four people in the room were gathered around one table, on it there was something that the other three didn't recognize. If a person from the world that Roland came from were here, they would quickly know what this was from how it looked. From the outside, it had a similar shape to a rifle. The item had a proper stock that could be held against the body for aiming. There was a trigger, a grip, and even something that looked like an ammo holder that had a cylindrical shape but was on the side and a bit in front of the trigger. Even though it looked like some kind of strange-looking rifle, there was one big problem. When looking at the barrel where the projectile would normally come out, there was no hole. Instead of it being hollow on the inside it was a thick rod made from metal. Everything in this construction was made from metal and covered in runic inscriptions. To anyone from this world, this was clearly a strange runic staff. Then there was a strange little dial on the opposite side of the cylinder part. Ah yes, I guess you'd call this a runic rifle? 
but I guess calling it a runic staff or wand wouldn't be that off, but it will be faster if I just showed you. Roland picked up this runic rifle into his hands and placed himself at a distance from the target dummies at the end of this chamber. This room had been made with space in mind so the ceiling was high at about 4 meters. Then the distance from the targets was about 30 meters. The three other people that were gathered here just looked at each other while shrugging. They all knew that Roland had a trouble communicating with others, so they waited for him to demonstrate. He took aim while holding the gun with both his hands. Even though he was a person from the modern days, he didn't really know much about rifles. At a base level, he did know that a gun used ammunition to produce pressure in the gun barrel to propel the projectile forward. Luckily for him, the one that he was using didn't need something like this to work, instead, it could operate thanks to the portable batteries that he made for his golems. Thanks to this invention he was able to create this weapon that could give people with lower levels and non-combative classes a fighting chance. Boom! A bolt of blue energy flew forward and connected with what would be the chest area on the wooden dummy. The magical blast was enough to create a nice hole while also making the whole target shake. I need to optimize the sights some more, I'll probably fashion a laser pointer instead if you can't get the hang of it, is something wrong? Well. The three looked at each other while looking somewhat unconvinced. This time around Elidia was the one to speak up. I think what Bernier was trying to say is that we probably won't have enough mana to use a large wand like that, I can barely use that little gift that you gave me, remember? I knew you would say that but you don't need to worry, you won't need to use your own mana to make this fire, look at this. Finally, he showed off the cylinder inside of it was one of the batteries that he used for his golems. Thanks to it anyone would be able to use this gun by just pressing the trigger and taking aim. In reality, this wasn't anything groundbreaking as other craftsmen in this world had created similar products. The biggest difference was the power source, while they used monofluid or crystals he used his own rechargeable batteries. With the closed cylinder from the outside, no one would be able to tell this fact. The batteries that he produced were probably the biggest gold mine that he was sitting on. Regretfully he didn't have the ability to come forward with his design. One of the reasons was that it would be difficult to convince people that these batteries were better than monocrystals. Then there was the actual problem, if people took them seriously he was afraid that they would try to force his secrets out of him. It was renewable energy and they only needed to create more generators to fuel them. If the big players in the kingdom found out that they could have unlimited magical energy for their magical weaponry, he wouldn't be surprised if the high mages came knocking. Luckily it wasn't that difficult to pass these off as cylinders for mana fluid instead, most people would not even think of looking inside. Really, I don't need to use my mana? Can I try it, boss? Sure go ahead. Roland nodded while Bernier grabbed the rifle and started looking over it. The runic designs that were on it were now dim, but when they fired off they were quite bright with a blue glow. I think I heard of these sorts of weaponry but I think they were mostly used during the war efforts. Diana commented while Bernier took aim, without this gun working on pressure it didn't have that big of a kickback. Even when he pulled the trigger his arm didn't twitch that much but instead of hitting the target he connected with the ceiling right above it. Oops this is interesting. You should try looking through that sight, it will help you aim. Roland helped Bernier position himself and gave him some pointers for aiming. Also can you see this dial on the other side, try moving it forward and then using it. Bernier nodded while feeling that there was something on the other side, with a click the dial was turned to point on a green dot. Now he took aim again while looking through the side but instead of the blue bolt of energy getting hurled forward a large blast of wind was created. This time around he was pushed back and fell on his posterior. From a regular magic bolt spell, it was changed to a burst of wind energy. The weapon has several options, if you set it to the red dot it will create a constant stream of flames that goes in a cone, the one you just used isn't lethal but will push anyone away, it could probably also cause an arrow to curve away from its course. Go ahead, test them all out, it belongs to you now. Damn. Thanks boss but warn me next time. Hey Diana, there is one for you too there, 
you can go test it out and as for you Elidia, I made something smaller. Elidia was lacking in strength, she would not be able to hold a rifle made from heavy metal without her hands shaking. For her, Roland created a smaller version that looked more like a pistol with the battery cylinder in the middle of it. This made it somewhat look like one of those old western revolvers. This one can't produce that much magical energy but it should be enough to even injure a lower level tier 2 warrior. Elidia looked at the revolver that was handed to her with curious eyes. She was not much for violence but after seeing Bernier and his wife have fun shooting at the targets, even she started to feel curious. But if you find yourself against a more difficult enemy, remember to run instead, and don't forget about those runic scrolls I gave you. You worry too much. She smiled at him while awkwardly holding the runic gun with both hands without trying to press the trigger. Roland had already given her various card-sized runic scrolls with various effects so this new weapon was just clogging up her already large arsenal. Well, I have to go back to the dungeon, I'll feel better if you at least keep this by your side when you are in the shop but you'll need to learn how to use it or you might hurt yourself instead. While these weapons didn't guarantee anything, a bandit would think twice about attacking if they were against someone that was able to fire off magical arrows at them from afar. This was the best part about ranged weapons like this, they were easy to use yet hard to master. Almost anyone could point it and hit something if they fired off enough. If you think so. Elidia just nodded while slowly pointing the weapon at the target as she was instructed. As she pulled the trigger though, the flash of blue light caused her to close her eyes while shifting the runic revolver above her head to hit the ceiling. You guys need to stop hitting the ceiling. Roland groaned while taking the gun out of his girlfriend's hands, it seemed that he would need to spend some time helping them to aim. Chapter 186, Testing Grind Area You have defeated a bladed volcanic Cornitoris. I think I'm getting better at this. The neck of the large dinosaur exploded before him just like before. His grenade-throwing abilities had clearly leveled up as he didn't even need to aim that much. Just like before the enemy was the same type and used exactly the same tactics. Roland had already figured out the best way to tackle this monster and none of his golems had been damaged in the process either. Awoo! Oh, no, you can't have the mana stone this time either. Agni curled up his tail while looking at the dead creature before him. His mouth was watering while looking at the beast with the biggest mana stone that he had ever seen. Don't be a glutton. You already devoured so many on our way here, you're going to pick up some strange skills. Roland gave out a sigh while cutting a hole in the dead monster. This time around he didn't plan on taking out his runic chainsaw. The monster parts would fetch some coin but he would rather spend the time on the more important issue, the secret room. Let me just check this chest out and be on my way doesn't seem to be a mimic, is my luck increasing? After checking for traps and hidden monsters the chest was opened up. Inside they found a set of twin daggers with a simple burning enchantment. They were made from deep steel which at this point was very common. More crap. This was somewhat disappointing as these daggers weren't of good quality. For someone who could create better runic versions of the same magical effects, this was nothing. If he put it together with the items that he made, he felt like he was lowering the prestige of his own store. Maybe I'll make some kind of discount bin for items that don't have much worth or don't sell that well. While thinking about some shop improvements he tossed the daggers into the golem mule. This was already his second time here, now that he was more familiar with the road and the monsters lurking here, his speed increased. If this continues, I won't need to prepare any traps for that Cornitoris anymore but it is peculiar that the boss never changes. He could only shrug at this strange occurrence as instead of the boss changing, what changed were the creatures outside this chamber he was in. Without any time to contemplate this issue, he moved towards the second secret opening that led outside this room. It took him back to the long maze filled with many corridors but no more monsters. Those only appeared when he came out of the area with the various minerals. Just like before, this could be left to Agni as he was itching to sink his fangs into some mana stones. Doesn't seem that anyone has been here, my secret is safe for now. Without waiting he hurried his mule golem up. 
Within it were his spider drones that he had all repaired. Thanks to the pre-existing schematics it wasn't that hard to remake these golems. Bernier and his wife were able to produce them if he asked them to. The runic program they run on could also be copied over without it taking that much time. Thus he was able to recuperate the loss of the spider drone that he had lost the last time he was here. The one that he gave to Arthur Valerian was a newer design that he made separately so he was back to having six little helpers again. While for now all of them were busy drilling holes in the ground, he was standing before the entrance to the other secret part. The tier 3 monster should not be able to see me. Roland needed to remind himself that the beings inside could not see him even though he could see them. With a pickaxe in his hand, he started striking the area that would lead him to his new grinding spot, that is if he learned to use it. The layer isn't that deep but it's somewhat hidden behind rocks. It only took him about five minutes to create an opening big enough for one of his spider drones to fit through. Just like before, he could hear the strange combination of heavy armor and bones rattling about coming from the hole he made. There were no tier 3 monsters in the vicinity yet but this just gave him more time to think about his next action. Theoretically, those monsters can't enter through this gap even if I make it larger, but what of their weapons or magical attacks? Roland had read some books about such occurrences but there wasn't much data to go off of. Finding a spot where two dungeons connected was quite rare and not much had been done in this field of study. The kitty professor didn't know anything either, this was not his speciality as he found adventuring below his very existence. The adventurer guild probably knows something about it but not like I can ask them for help, any idiot would figure out that I'm hiding something. Was it just such a rare occurrence that not many people had the chance to study it? Or was the adventurer guild hiding specific information instead? From what he knew, whenever something like this occurred the adventurer guild swooped in to take charge. This was also one of the biggest reasons that he decided to keep this secret for himself. Roland peeked through the hole and he could see familiar shadows moving through the lit corridors. It was time to prepare for his investigation but first, he decided to gather some of the minerals that were here before venturing forward. While he wanted to do nothing more than go through with his test, he needed to gather some materials first. If for some reason he found himself in danger and had to run, he would be wasting the opportunity for mining. Some of the rare ores didn't respond fully yet as expected. When looking for the rare material which was the red variant of mithril, he didn't find any in the last spot that he found it. Ores like durium that weren't as rare managed to grow back to some extent but it was clear that he could not just form this place with no end. The dungeon needed time to restore itself and rare ores took even more. Thus together with his small group of drill spiders, he continued to scout for more ores. The ones that were easily accessed were prioritized as he still wanted to save some time. Even then, it took him about two days of hard work to get a load that he was satisfied with. After this, it was time to prepare for the worst. First, he packed up the mule golem while also removing a satchel filled with various scrolls and runic bombs. While he didn't expect the monsters to come at him through the hole, if they somehow did, he would need to stop them. Roland had gained quite the expertise with these runic explosives that he created. Even if they were just on scrolls they could create devastating effects. Thinking back to that tier 3 ant queen type monster that he faced, he knew that tier 3 monsters could be hurt even by tier 2 runic explosives. It was just a matter of jerry-rigging enough of them to create a big enough blast. This time around, he was not going to have his arm explode. Without a high-leveled priest anywhere in the dungeon, he didn't think he would be able to survive it. With that in mind, he had to create an escape route for himself and Agni. The mule golem could be easily placed in the secret passage to wait. Luckily with his ever-increasing golemic knowledge, he didn't have to endanger himself too much. I finally got this thing working. The runic mines and bombs weren't his only plan, everything hinged on the crystal ball that was placed on a large square display. There were many runic symbols everywhere on it and the orb fit nicely into a top compartment. Inside of it, there was a runic battery that helped power the construction. Time to test it, Agni keep watch, don't want any monsters running the test run. 
the ruby wolf yawned a bit while not spotting any enemies in the vicinity. Agni had cleared out the area a long time ago and now after roaming for two days, he was bored. Roland grabbed one of the better-looking spider golems. With a gentle finger poke, he attended it to the wavelength of the device he had created. This blocky creation was something akin to a remote control just much stronger. With the added batteries and his own mana, he would be able to move the golem remotely even from a great distance. Then there was the crystal orb on the top. It had been a while since he had started his work on runic crystal balls. It was somewhat difficult but he did manage to connect it to the golem's eye sensors. The image wouldn't be that clear as the golems saw things somewhat differently than the humans that made them. Finally, he placed his hand on the large remote box. It started glowing with the usual blue light as the runic symbols became active. After about half a minute he was finally able to see an image. What he saw was a blob of red coloring and also various shades of blue and green. The image he got was something similar to heat vision or infrared. Regretfully they were down in a heat-filled dungeon which made things difficult to see. Thus he started circling through the options that he had. The golem eyes were quite sophisticated devices. They had various possible settings which infrared vision was just one. The next one that he switched to produced a somewhat bluish creature that looked like some kind of ghostly dog. Roland's golem at this point in time was looking at Agni. The ruby wolf was a creature filled with a lot of mana so he shone quite brightly when filtered through the golem's mana detectors. While this type of vision would normally not be that great as it only outlined mana, in a dungeon it was different. The walls, the ceiling, everything in this place was filled with this blue energy. Thanks to this he was given a world filled with blue with everything being outlined nicely. The air didn't have enough mana to register as much, thus it didn't block the view too much. This doesn't look too bad, but I think it can still be better. Roland continued to fiddle around with the image the crystal ball was giving him. With the possibility of combining some of the various visual options that the golem I offered he was finally able to make it satisfactory. Now the spider drone was ready to venture through the hole and perform some tests against the tier 3 monsters inside. Okay Agni, come here we will wait by the entrance, if something happens we will run, don't even think about attacking anything that comes through there, do you understand? Awoo! Agni flopped out his tongue while running circles around Roland. He was smart enough to know the dangers but was just probably curious what his master was planning. Good let us begin, all the traps are set in place. Roland had previously blocked the opening with a larger boulder but it was now clear. The walls next to it were plastered with runic scrolls from all sides. If something tried to bust through those walls they would quickly explode. With so many scrolls there, even a tier 3 monster would be stopped in its tracks. This wasn't all as more of the smaller card-sized scrolls were scattered on the ground. They weren't as explosive as the large ones but would probably at least stagger his foe. While it was blundering about Roland and Agni would have enough time to quickly run into the secret room behind them. While monsters tended to chase their victims for a while there was a timer on it. After some time the monster would lose interest or forget about what it was doing. It was a game-like phenomenon that convinced him that he would be able to get away if the need arose. With everything in order, Roland kneeled down before the box and started operating the golem through it. By inputting commands he was now able to make the spider drone move around. He was already used to this task so there was no need for any further tests and the golem quickly made its way towards the hole in the wall. It crawled up and peeked right through it and to Roland's surprise there was a juicy test subject right on schedule. In the middle of the corridor the hole led to, was the same monster type he saw here a month ago when he was here the last time, an infernal skeleton champion. Good, it's not the lich, this one shouldn't have any ranged attacks besides fire breath. He commented while moving the golem through the hole a bit more. While clearing out the path he made sure that the drone would have enough space to move around. The path that the golem needed to take was only about one meter in length. From his tests, the other dungeon started right at the end of that one meter long path. With that in mind, he positioned the golem right outside the range. He already knew that the monsters would attack the golems as one of them had already been trashed. 
Well then, here goes nothing. Just to be safe Roland turned around and opened the secret door that was right behind him. It was time to see how the monster would react to an attack. With another command given a latch to the side opened out and a small rod on a joint slid out. It pointed at the monster's head area while slowly charging up with mana. Soon a bright blue arrow of condensed energy flew forward the tier 3 infernal skeleton champion. Roland's face was glued to the crystal orb that was showing him the image and it was clear that the monster felt something. The monster was looking somewhere to the side but as the projectile entered its dungeon it turned to face it. This didn't mean that it was fast enough to protect itself, the golem's aim was true, and the mana arrow connected with the monster's head. Direct hit it suffered some damage. Roland's golem could measure its enemy's health points, the mana arrow that was a lower level tier 2 spell had managed to lower it slightly. When going through the numbers the damage was minuscule and not worth mentioning. The monster's head that was hit didn't move much. Its face was covered by a Roman-styled helmet that didn't protect the front too well. While the helmet rattled slightly the monster didn't budge from its spot. The flames that burned from its eye sockets started burning brightly as it looked towards the area that the mana bolt came from but... It's not doing anything. At first, it looked like the monster would do something. It started to look at the spot the attack came from and there was a clear surge in mana inside of its body. Then after a moment, it subsided and the monster went back to looking to the other side. This somewhat confirmed what Roland was suspecting but more tests were in order. Thus without waiting he moved to fire off more mana arrows towards the monster. This time around two in sequence. Just as before the skeleton's face was smacked with the mass of mana and its health decreased by a smidgen again. It turned to face the spot it was attacked from and waited. Then while looking at the spot where Roland's golem was, another mana arrow flew its way. Now there was some movement, this monster was holding a sword and a shield. The moment the mana arrow entered its range it moved to block the attack with its shield. The arrow was unable to put a dent on the shield the skeleton was holding either way. It moved slightly. It's still not charging the wall, nor does it seem enraged. While the monster turned to face the hole in the wall and reacted to the second attack it soon returned to what it was previously doing. After these tests, Roland was almost positive that he was safe but to be sure he continued for some time longer. But as time passed it became clear that this would be a perfect spot to raise his levels. Chapter 187, Fast Levels A magical bolt of energy flew through the air and connected with a face made of only bones. It was a direct hit on a tier 3 monster that didn't do much to evade it. It came flying from a small mechanical spider that had its metallic legs pressed into the rocks around it. I don't think I'll be able to kill this thing like that. Roland, who was controlling the spider golem, gave out a sigh after continuing to pelt it with mana arrows. Even though he could land direct hits on the monster's head, they weren't doing much damage. The moment the monster's HP dropped below 80% it also started to regenerate its own HP through some skill. This self-regenerating effect wasn't that strong but it cancelled out the golem's attacks in the process. It was clear that if he wanted to kill this creature he would either need to do it himself or utilize all of his golems. It does seem safe but it might also react to a living being differently than to a golem. While the test that he performed went well, he still wasn't sure if the monster wouldn't attack him. In theory, he should be safe but this didn't keep him from worrying. Now came the real test, one that involved him using an attack spell just like the golem did. Agni, stay here. Roland used his remote control station to pull the golem out of the hole. The constant usage of mana arrows had also drained most of the golem's battery that needed to now be replaced. Thus the spider golem dislodged itself from the small hole that was made for it and returned to its creator. For the time being Roland decided to replace the battery while also ordering the other golems to spread out around this area. While previously he only intended to run, now he might need a distraction if for some reason the monster burst through the rocky wall. The golems would only serve as more targets while he and Agni escaped into the secret passage. Normally anyone would have a tough time approaching that hole with all the mines that he had placed there. Luckily there was a big advantage in being the creator of those runic mines and explosives. 
Due to the extensive studying, he had to go through he figured out a couple of new tricks. One of them was to give the items that he created a sort of back door. Now with a small jolt of his own mana he could produce a sort of disabling effect when wearing his armor or having a sort of master key item with a specific runic program on it. Thanks to it he could disable all of the mines that he placed here. He could even put them on a timer or activate them when he was out of range. Thanks to this, none of his current creations would be able to harm him, as long as he was in possession of an item with the master key function. I'll disable them for the time being. It was time for the big test so he decided to disable the mines while slowly approaching the hole. He felt a bit silly for being so overly cautious but it was better to be safe than sorry. Would those guys be okay if something happened to me? A strange thought crawled into his mind as he was staring at the side profile of the skeleton champion. He thought to the people above ground, Elidia had recovered her deed to the orphanage but if he vanished Arthur would probably not help her if any of the merchants did something similar. Bernier that was a half-dwarf and shunned by the dwarven population in the city would have a hard time finding work. His wife had also crossed the line after associating herself with Roland so they might have to leave the city altogether. After opening the shop and becoming a business owner other people relied on him being there. While they would probably be able to find a place to stay, their lives would become difficult if he was gone. It was a strange feeling where people relied on him but he was not averse to this responsibility. You sure are an ugly one. He called out while looking through the hole. The monster didn't react which prompted him to walk a bit closer. It really couldn't hear or see him in any way shape or form. It didn't seem that there would be a problem thus he brought out a magical staff. The design was quite rudimentary with a large mana stone as the focal point. Agni that was watching from the distance quickly picked up on the stone's origin as it was fashioned from the previous boss monster's remains. The staff wrapped around this gem at the top. This was his first ether durasteel product that he had fashioned with his new smelter and forge. Here goes nothing. The monster on the other side started moving away, it seemed it was bored with getting its face pelted with mana arrows. This was great as if something went wrong the monster would need to turn around. Thus he took aim, the staff's shaft started glowing as the runes on it became more visible. Infernal Skeleton Champion, it was an undead creature with a fire aspect to it. Normally undead monsters were susceptible to fire but resistant to the cold. These creatures were the exact opposite yet unless a person could generate enough cold energy to douse their flames they would continue to function. Their biggest weakness was in holy energy but that element was exclusive to priest type classes. They were the best class to bring along when fighting a large number of undead creatures. While there were magical items that were able to produce divine magic, the assistance of a priest was needed. There was a peculiar manufacturing process for those types of weapons and armor which he had read up on during his learning phase. The worst part about it was that such weapons needed to be constantly recharged by the same type of priest that lent their blessing. The only way to go around it would be to get some specific materials that had divine energy in them. He considered paying his old acquaintance a visit but in retrospect, he didn't really know Sister Kasha that well. Whenever she spotted him walking around town she would try to shove the teachings of Solaria down his throat. He was also unsure if he could trust her with his workshop where she would need to come to craft these special divine items. Thus instead of going with any particular element, he decided to use the basics. A tier 2 frost lance would not be able to combat a tier 3 monster's flames. Instead, he decided to produce the strongest non-elemental spell that he could. The staff continued to glow in a blue hue while forming a ball of light before it. This ball of light started spinning around and changing shape into a drill. This drill of pure blue mana continued to accelerate while producing a piercing sound which the monster on the other side could not hear. This was no simple spell, it was more similar to the one he produced all those years ago against the Ant Queen. It was a combination spell that stored all of the mana energy at a single point while adding a spin to it. A massive amount of mana was being produced and also drained from Roland's reserves. With a resounding boom, the spell in the shape of a drill flew forward and caused the dug-up opening to be widened in the process. 
The monster stopped in its tracks as the bolt of blue energy entered its dungeon but just like with the golem it was not fast in its reaction time. The spiraling spell connected right with the monster's head. At first, Roland was surprised as the skeleton didn't just lose its head on the spot. The spell slowly drilled itself into that skeletal jaw before exploding. He could see the entire corridor where that flaming skeleton was standing shake and be covered in blue light. The flash of azure subsided rather quickly and revealed a headless opponent that was just standing there. Roland could see the health bar getting lowered drastically as the monster clearly received a critical hit to its head. Regretfully this wasn't over, the undead creature could function without its head but would not be unable to see. These types of skeletal enemies possessed something called a soul core. It looked like a flame of energy akin to a will-o'-wisp, with varying colors. This flame could be situated in various areas of the monster and in the lesser flaming skeletons, it was inside the skull. This was also what Roland had hoped when targeting its flaming head. It seemed that this core was not there as the health bar only decreased by about a quarter. The monster was covered by heavy armor which made spotting the weak point even harder. Damn, it might be in the chest cavity. The second spot for this flaming core would be inside of the monster's ribs where the heart would be. The biggest problem with that was that this monster was wearing heavy armor but luck was still on his side. The enemy was now missing a head and after swinging wildly around itself it just stopped. It was unable to detect where the attack came from, it could not detect where Roland was standing. Thus instead of running he just continued with another mana drill spell. With another charge up, the spinning projectile that was composed of pure mana energy rocketed towards its target and connected with another loud sound. Roland wasn't sure what the armor was composed of but luckily it wasn't something resistant to mana. The spell met some resistance but continued to corkscrew its way inside of the monster's torso before vanishing into a burst of tiny mana particles. The hole it produced wasn't that big but it was a beginning. Without having to worry about getting attacked he could just focus on attacking. The monster was quite resistant and he needed to pelt it with the enhanced runic spell over and over again. But finally, after downing down a mana potion, he saw the last bit of health of the monster shot down to zero. Infernal Skeleton Champion has been slain. Congratulations you have leveled up. Congratulations you have gained a new title. Tear Breaker. Title. A title given to people that have managed to single-handedly slay an adversary that is a tier above them. When fighting against opponents of a higher tier the bearer of this title will receive a buff. The moment the monster hit the floor he was flooded with a myriad of system prompts. The first thing that he noticed was the title that he was given. He wasn't sure how large of a buff this was but perhaps it would alleviate this tiresome drain on his mana reserves. He was left sweating and with a headache after having to force himself to blast the monster repeatedly with a spell that went over his own limits. Then there was his level that shot up to 123 just for slaying this one monster here. With this, he was reaching the limit of 125 at which he would need to change his class to progress further the staff didn't break down good. If he attempted to make this staff from deep steel like his old wares, it would have certainly not been able to take the burden of this enhanced spell. Now on the other hand, after adding some special minerals to the mix, the new Durasteel staff was still working fine. It had lasted through the test but he was already thinking of making some improvements on this grinding method. The only reason that he decided to make this staff was its mobility. Without knowing how the monster inside would react he needed something light. Now he was positive that he could just pelt the monsters inside with a barrage of spells, he could bring something larger. It would be a shame to leave here only after killing one monster. Then, what should I do about the spoils? While the levels and title were nice, he stood before another question. What should he do with the dead skeleton? After receiving his last spell the monster along with its damaged armor was thrown against the wall. It was now close to the end of that corridor where there were probably other opponents lurking about. There were some options here, first, he could just leave the damaged armor be and wait for another monster to appear. This would be the safest route to take where he wouldn't lose anything. The second option would be to widen the hole between dungeons and quickly go inside to grab the monster's remains before they fade away. 
This would be the most dangerous decision as he didn't really know if there were any traps in that corridor or perhaps some hidden monsters that he couldn't see. Should I go with option 3? He turned around to look at the spider golems that were on standby. The safest way of getting the loot would be to send the golems in. They could drag the monster's remains over to this chamber while he remained safe. After the monster was dead, its remains would be able to pass through the barrier between the two dungeons. The golems had grappling hooks with nets that he designed against the boss monster. In theory, he could try shooting it from the safety of this chamber and then pull the monster's remnants in himself. This was probably the safest way to get to the loot while not risking his golemic creations in the process either. There was one problem with this approach, he didn't think the net would be able to encase the dead monster that was down on the floor. It was designed to envelop a large target that was standing up. For it to work correctly he would need to use the remote control and probably have one of the drones go in. Is it worth it? Roland started calculating in his head. The monster's remains could be used by alchemists, they ground the bones into powder and turn them into various concoctions. Then there was the armor that was probably made from a good metal, while the chest part had been damaged the rest was in good shape. Everything could be sold to make a sound profit that could go for more than the resources needed to build a spider golem. When adding everything up he decided to risk one of his creations. First, the net was shot out by one of the other golems. Then he used the remote control to maneuver a second unit into the other higher tier dungeon. There the golem was used to shift the net in a more favorable position. For once luck was on his side as he was able to start pulling before anything on the other side could get closer. The hole through which he was previously aiming had also increased in size after being pelted by multiple intense mana drills. Thus right before another monster appeared he was able to get the remains of the tier 3 monster out. The only part that was left behind was the head that was dislodged in the beginning. This is made from an alloy, it has some deep steel in it but also durium and what's this resistium. With his current identification skills, he was somewhat able to read into the composition of this suit of armor. He was not able to figure out all components nor the distribution. Resistium was another metal that was seen as something between the tier 2 and tier 3 level. Its strength came in being able to absorb physical attacks. It was quite lucky that the monster was wearing armor that was very resistant to physical attacks but not so much when it came to magical ones. Perhaps he had used up all his bad luck in his first ten years and now it was time for the renaissance of his life. Something is coming. While looking at the spoils he noticed a shadow moving in the distance. Another monster was coming his way and he was certainly intending to get to this level cap before getting out of this dungeon. Chapter 188 Oh God, my eye. A high pitch whistling sound filled the cavern along with a blue glow. The light soon took form as it spiraled around in place to form a drill of azure. This energy construct quickly vanished from sight as it rocketed forward towards an ugly looking monstrosity. Venomous High Ghoul has been slain. Congratulations you have leveled up. Congratulations you have leveled up. The level limit has been reached unable to gain more experience. You have gained a new skill, Runic Eye of Truth. Roland moved the still glowing magical staff to the side. It was producing a lot of smoke while looking somewhat used up. It was showing signs of runic erosion, the glowing symbols weren't as clear and the magical spell that he produced had diminished in power. I guess even Durasteel can't handle altered runes like this. The spell that he produced was probably something between a tier 2 and a tier 3 rank. It had enough power to kill off stationary targets like the ones inside this grinding spot but was inefficient. It required for the caster to fill it up with their mana for too long, thus causing the runes to deteriorate faster. That creature's regenerative skills were far too high. First, he came across the Infernal Skeleton Champion. Then he also saw a lich but the monster that stayed in the corridor was this ghoul. While ghouls were seen as a lesser version of a more intelligent monster that was a vampire, they were not weak. Some could even overpower their more conscious brethren in a fight. They were undead creatures that could mend their own wounds in a matter of moments. With no other targets that he could choose from, he was left in a prolonged ranged battle where he slowly overwhelmed the creature with his runic magic. 
This of course overloaded the weapon he created while also made him use up quite the amount of mana potions in the process. For the time being, it did its job but the next time he attempted this venture, he needed a change in weaponry that wouldn't drain him of his magical energy. Best if I leave this one be. The dead ghoul was already decomposing into a pile of flesh. The moment it was dead and unable to regenerate itself its body started to break down. The only usable part would be the tier 3 mana stone it had but regretfully another monster had decided to stay in the room. It was quite a surprising sight, it was the lich type that showed some interest in its dead comrade. The monster did something that he didn't expect, it picked up the sparkling mana stone from the ground into its bony hand and then promptly ate it. While Roland wasn't a specialist when it came to monster behavior he was sure that this was not something ordinary. The monster couldn't see him but even after eating that mana stone, it continued to stay in that corridor while staring in his direction. After maxing out his level there was no reason for him to kill more tier 3 monsters other than farming their bodies for materials. The staff he made was still operational and he could always repair the runes but for the time being he decided to close the opening to the other dungeon. Instead he would use the rest of the time to gather up more of the ores. Thus he placed some boulders in the opening to not have to see the ugly flaming skull of the lich. With his new level also came a nice surprise, he had gained a new skill when his runesmith lord class had maxed out. Runic Eye of Truth Active Skill Reveals the truth of the world to its user. That's kind of vague, what is this truth? If it's the truth, why is this skill called the Runic Eye of Truth and not just Eye of Truth? He had many questions about this skill but the fastest way of discovering what it was about, was just to use it. As with all the skills that came before, there was a sort of implantation of knowledge the moment he received it. How he could activate it was known to him but what it did was another thing. The spider droids were back at work and Agni was patrolling the area so he had time to test things out. Without much reservation, he decided to activate the skill. This time around he would learn an important lesson, not all skills were the same and some like this one had drawbacks. First, the skill activated and he could feel a large chunk of his massive mana pool being drained in an instant. While he couldn't see it, his left eye began glowing as something appeared before him. This something were runic components and they were everywhere. At first he was baffled by what he was seeing, the dungeon walls, the lava pool, even the air was covered in runic symbols. It was somewhat similar to the world of illusions that he witnessed all those years before but he was certainly not in an illusion. Roland didn't get much time to figure out what this new skill was trying to show him. After a couple of seconds, his head felt like it was hit by a sledgehammer. He was burning up and the longer this skill was activated the blurrier his vision became, then just before he was about to pass out he managed to cancel the effect. He dropped down to his knees while clutching the left side of his head. He could feel something dripping down from this side and when he pulled his hand away, there was blood. His left eye had suffered an injury and he was bleeding from it. The pain was sharp and his vision blurry before him. Without a second thought he moved his hand into his satchel to take out a greater potion of healing. With haste he poured it over his eyes while also drinking the rest. Thanks to his quick thinking the pain started to subside and his darkened vision also slowly returned to him. A woo. Ugh my eye. Roland felt something moist touching his forehead which turned out to be Agni's nose. He had collapsed on the ground and actually passed out for a few minutes which gave Agni a scare. His head was killing him and he felt like puking. I'm fine Agni, just give me a moment. Slowly he moved over to a larger rock that he could lean against. There he tried waiting it out, the piercing headache that he received didn't subside even after he drank some mana restoring potions along with the healing ones. Only after half an hour did he find himself released from the sharp pain that felt like the worst migraine he ever had. What the hell was that? Roland placed his palm over the left side of his face where the skill was activated. His eye was still pulsating but thankfully he could see through it. This was the first time something like this had happened to him. He heard of skills injuring their users but not by this much on the first try. After calming down he thought back to the moment he activated the skill. 
the world seemed to shift into something different and most of the surroundings turned to runes. Runic Eye of Truth Wait. He tried to figure out this new skill but his memory was somewhat hazy after the splitting headache occurred. But thanks to his high intelligence he was able to go back and remember. Not everything was covered in runes. Agni was there not that far away and he did recall the ruby wolf moving into his line of sight. His wolf was not composed of runes while almost everything around him was. Maybe it doesn't work on living beings. After some time to deliberate, he came to a few conclusions. He wasn't totally sure but considering that the dungeon was covered in runes could be attributed to its magical nature. That would somewhat explain why everything was composed of runic components. This eye skill was somehow translating everything into runic language but the strain on his eye was too massive for him to use it. That could be the case, but I could also be wrong, perhaps the skill didn't work on Agni because the level was too low. He wasn't sure what to make of it but after suffering through that sharp pain he wasn't too keen on activating it again. Perhaps if he left the dungeon and tried it out in a location devoid of mana and magic he wouldn't suffer that much of a backlash. Perhaps if there were fewer things in his range of vision he could alleviate some of the pain. Ugh. Finally, he decided to stand up but found it hard to keep his legs from shaking. Even with all his stats and a rather high level, the new skill put him through the ringer. For the time being, he decided to seal off this new ability as he clearly couldn't handle it yet. Perhaps he would need to increase his level to actually be able to stomach it. It took him several hours to get a hold of himself, the potions that he had with him didn't do much to alleviate the sick feeling he experienced. There were still more ores to mine before he could leave. The spider drones continued to drill holes near the ore deposits as he decided to take it easy and just pick up what they mined out. After venturing here once he had worked on the mining software of these golems. They were able to distinguish between the more worthwhile minerals now which made this expedition a bit more lucrative. Thus he continued his work while feeling somewhat exhausted. Only after about a day was he back to his old self and working along with his golemic creations. With this being his second mining expedition he had managed to bag a bit more than previously while also minimizing the size of the more useless volcanic chunks of the dungeon. His way back was uneventful, just like last time he waited for people to clear out while looking at his radar that he expanded as wide as he could. No bandits or robbers greeted him this time around, probably the people from the thieves guild would be more careful after one of theirs never returned that day. When he returned home it was early in the morning. The mule golem slowly lumbered behind him as he entered his house. Even though he spent less time on this expedition he felt much more exhausted than last time. He wasn't sure if it was due to the new skill he used or the mana spent on blasting the tier 3 creatures. There were two things on his mind, the first one was the new skill while the other one was his new class. Finally, he reached level 125 and his runesmith lord class had reached its maximum. Now he would finally be able to change it but to what he wasn't quite sure. Before he attempted the change, he kind of wanted to test this new eye ability out. Perhaps he would need to for the coming class change. But for the time being, he decided to go to sleep, it was early morning and the shop was closed tomorrow so he could relax. Hey! Roland opened up his eyes to discover a familiar-looking ceiling. His body was bare and surrounded in water as he had fallen asleep in the bathtub yet again. After raising himself and wrapping a towel around his nether regions he noticed a note on the bathroom door. Please stop falling asleep in the bathroom, you'll catch a cold. I also left you some food in the runic cold box. It was a note from Elidia that apparently visited him when he was out cold. It was late at night and he had slept through the entire day. When outside he found some sandwiches in his refrigerator that he quickly devoured. After a day's rest, he felt rather refreshed and ready for more work. First came the unloading of the mule golem, with more durium he would be able to create the golem for Arthur now. But before that, he also intended to attempt a class change. The only thing remaining would be to visit the Sun Church and get a few class change crystals perhaps more than one if he finally did fail. Even if he had more, 
Bernier or Elidia could always use them instead as they were also slowly leveling up and reaching higher levels. Before even attempting this change he decided to see what was up with this runic eye of truth. If his theory was correct the best way to use it was in an environment devoid of magic or many magical items. For his testing ground, he decided to use an empty storage area that was recently built. There wasn't anything in there for the time being and the walls were thick. Even though the walls were reinforced via magic they weren't constantly radiating mana like in the dungeon he visited. After some preparations, he closed the door to this room while also placing down a wooden box. On this box was a small card which had one of the most basic spells on it, a mana bolt. If this skill was affected by the number of magical items and their grade, then choosing something on the lower spectrum would make it easier on his eye. I guess here goes nothing. To the side, he had some recovery potions, one of the bottles was already open so that he could pour it on his face if his eye started bleeding again. Then there was another tiny bottle that he instantly drank, it was a pain-numbing solution for just in case. Besides the box and the card, there was a single chair on which Roland sat down. After going through the pain just a few days before he was really not keen on activating it again but he needed to know if he could use this skill in any way before moving on. Here goes nothing. With his mana being full he activated the skill once more. This time around the pain wasn't as bad as before. His eye started glowing while he focused on the runic spell scroll before him. Just as he had theorized if he didn't move around and just focused on a smaller point before him the skill was somewhat usable. Even with that, his MP was dropping rapidly but he had enough time to see what the skill was doing. This time around the only object that was covered in runes was the spell scroll, the wooden box remained just as it was. What the skill showed him was similar to what his debugging skill did but just in uniform color. Hmm. Roland thought to himself while quickly cancelling out this mana-hungry ability. While the first test was over, this wasn't over. If the skill was just a worse debugging skill then it would be something to laugh about but he had an idea of what it could do to help him with future endeavors. For the next test, he brought out a simple dagger. It looked old, the material it was made from was also not good. But this didn't matter, what mattered was that this was an enchanted item instead of a runic item. It was an old dagger one of the adventurers left behind after buying a superior one from his shop. Now it would be useful and show him if this skill could be used. Thus as before he activated the skill while staring directly at the dagger. Then just as he had speculated, he saw it, instead of enchantments he saw runic structures. These structures he recognized as they were for the sharpness rune that he had rune crafted many times in his life. Ha! Huh. Just as his mana went below half he quickly deactivated the skill. While he would need to test the eyes on higher quality items, it was clear what this skill was really doing. It was somehow translating the magical language into runic. But this wasn't over yet, one more test remained. There was another usage that this eye skill could have that he was itching to find out. Thus he quickly drank some mana potions while taking a small break. After two uses his eyes started getting slightly strained but he was able to continue. How did it go a ah, yes source of all magic? He began chanting, it was time to cast a spell. Even now he felt a bit silly when uttering the chance but after seeing other mages do it, he somewhat got used to it. A ball of blue light appeared in the middle of his palm as he finished casting. Then, quickly he activated the skill and to his surprise, he was also able to see them, runes. The ball of blue light had a runic structure that clearly was a direct translation of the same spell. Ha! Huh. It really works, I can use it like this. Oh shit! It hurts. His joyous outburst was short-lived as his left eye started burning up once more. He quickly cancelled out the skill and doused his face with a healing potion along with the pain-numbing concoction. Even though his face hurt and he felt like puking, this discovery brought a smile to his face. Chapter 189, Visiting the Church Ugh my head. Are you all right? Yes, I just need to rest for a bit. Roland was sitting on a chair while holding some cloth to his forehead. There was a clock of ice wrapped around it as he tried alleviating some of the pain. 
yesterday he had tried using his new skill and today the after effects of its use were still with him. After the first time in the dungeon, he didn't register any after effects but now there was an actual debuff. It would persist for another six hours and the only way to get rid of it would be to either go to a priest or drink a high level potion. This made it seem that this new skill that could translate spells into runes was tough to use. Even after analyzing one of the simplest spells he was out for almost an entire day. The debuff made him have a migraine and also caused his mana to run wild. If he attempted rune crafting at this very moment he felt that it would be a failure. Are you sure? Did you try the healing tincture? Ah, yes it wasn't strong enough, I think I might need to go to the church, I need to pick something up from there anyway. Roland commented while standing up. It was early in the day and the shop would be open. Elidia was with him but she needed to prepare the store. The reason he needed to go to the church was not really to ease the pain or the dizziness, it was to get a class change crystal. The only real problem was his skills that didn't quite hit the cap yet. This didn't mean that he wouldn't change his class though. The second tier 2 class mostly didn't take into consideration the other tier 2 class. Mostly titles and special requirements mattered but he would need to see the list before he made a decision. Then there was his new eye skill that he had no hope of leveling up anytime soon. This did put him in a conundrum as he would probably not be able to max all his skills within the first 25 levels of the new class he chose. While his leveling would start to slow down when he got closer to level 150, he would be able to attempt a class change. Tier 3 was something that he had set out to do in the shortest amount of time possible but unless he had the skills up he feared that the choice of classes would lessen in quality. Is that so? Have a safe journey then. Elidia just smiled at him after hearing that he would be making a trip to the church. After giving Roland a smooch on his aching forehead she along with Agni left for the store. The ruby wolf was able to leech some of those experience points along with his master. He too was now able to get a new class but he would need to wait for his master to recover before he chose a new form. Urk. Almost right after Elidia left the house Roland made a quick jump to the bathroom. He felt like he was back at his first year of college. The first few parties were quite hard on him then and his stomach took some time to get used to all of that alcohol. I really need to get something to alleviate these symptoms. After relieving himself of his breakfast he felt slightly better but still not at full capacity. Quickly he got his coat along with his light half-plate armor that lacked most of the hard-to-put-on parts. Without wanting to mope till the debuff had run out he headed towards the city. The walk there felt longer than usual but he managed to not stick out. After about 40 minutes of uneven walking, he managed to arrive at the church. Even now it felt gaudy to him. At first it started out as a small building but now it looked like some kind of cathedral. He wasn't sure how they did it but magic was probably involved. While the people in this world lacked the proper modern tools to build high up, there were certain magical ways of producing magnificent looking structures. Back at his own workshop, he performed some wall enhancements but it was nothing at this scale. He only dug up square shaped rooms and reinforced the walls, they weren't pretty but they did the job. Praise the sun. The moment one of the nuns spotted him at the church grounds he was greeted by their trademarked greeting. He only nodded at the nun that was dressed in a red and white habit. It looked strangely similar to the clothes that nuns wore back in his world just with a different color scheme and a large sun symbol on the back. Do you wish to hear the word of the Holy Mother? The nun asked while for some reason zoning on him like a hawk. Roland had a bit of trouble hanging out with these religious people. Some of them would always change the subject and try to preach to him. Most of the time they were only trying to receive a donation or peddle their wares so he decided to just cut to the chase. Is there an available priest? I would like to have a debuff removed and also buy a class change crystal. Oh my, a debuff? You have been graced by the lady's will, elder sister Kasha is receiving today. The girl that he was talking with was a low-leveled nun below the age of 20. There was a certain power structure in the church like everywhere in this world. They did give each other certain ranks and it was easy to figure out by the way they referred to each other. 
Sister Kasha for instance had leveled up past the 100th level and would not be around the gold rank adventurer level. If a nun achieved a level over 100 and managed to get her second tier 2 class they would be referred to as elder sister then if they managed to get into a tier 3 class, they would be given the title of mother. It was similar with their male counterparts which would normally be only called father after attaining a tier 3 class. Though there were exceptions and sometimes some of the more elderly priests would be given this title as more of an honorary one. Ah Sister Kasha Roland cringed a bit after hearing that the woman that he had to share the tent with was the one on duty. Memories of her trying to shove her whole Bible down his throat came rushing down his throat. While she was quite the beauty, it was mostly ruined when she opened up her mouth and started preaching the gospel. This world was different than his other, while Roland had never been big on religion he was not so sure now. There were clearly things at work here that could not be explained with science. Everyone had access to a strange system that gave them superpowers. Then the people at the church were getting strange blessings from their gods. Apparently, the devout believers would even hear the words of God and meet with them inside of the class change trials. If that was just an illusion created with the devout believer's mind, was up to debate. While these people were somewhat annoying it was also true that they did good deeds. The orphanages were mostly run by them and they did give the youngsters enough time to prepare for their adult life. They did not force anyone to become a priest, at most they tried to convince them to pick their side. Thus his opinion of the Solaria Church was mostly on the positive end. Just like in any organization there would be bad apples as the priest that Elidia ran into. But he could not hate the whole organization due to a few bad incidents. Nothing was perfect people still kept some of their desires even after putting on a habit. Do you need me to show you the way? The girl asked but he just shook his head. He had already been here to get his class change crystal when he used it to change to his current class. Then later he picked up one for Bernier when he had reached a higher level. There were a few sections to this building, the biggest one was what everyone would see. The inside was spacious with a high ceiling. On the end was a podium where the priests or nuns would perform their sermons. They had a large pipe organ in the back that was used to play some of the tunes. The stained glass windows in this church were quite stunning. They depicted Solaria in various ways as a beautiful woman with four fiery wings. In most depictions, she was shown with a sword and shield in her hands. While she was considered to be a motherly figure, people also revered her as a battle-hardened god of war. This was similar for any of the other divine beings that had some sort of battle background to them. It was as if every one of the deities needed their believers to be poised for combat. While the moon and sun churches were the most prevalent, there were some others. Some ran deep in the underground, like the cult that he had encountered all these years before. He found himself in this large hall, luckily the mass was over and the elder sister nun was accepting visitors. Kasha was not the highest ranking person in this congregation but she was the second in command. There were no tier 3 priests here yet, if she continued on her path then probably after some years she could attempt the class up. Name Kasha L109 Classes T2 Sun Maiden L9 T2 Sun Priest L50 T1 Acolyte L25 T1 Cleric L25 there she was in the distance, her hands were glowing with a golden light as she was healing some people. The miracles that the priest produced were very eye-catching and even standing close to them would give a person this warm tingling feeling. It was very easy to get lost in this spectacle and it was natural that many people flocked to it. From Roland's perspective, it was clear that they were purposely showing off the healing magic to the masses. To the untrained eye. This would be something unfathomable but to him who had dabbled in runic magic, it wasn't that special. I wonder. While normally he would make nothing off it, now with a new skill in his possession he was curious. It was a skill that translated magic into runes, but what of healing miracles? From what he could tell, these healing magics were considered different from regular magic. While they did use mana as the basic resource, there was something else there. Would this skill allow me to copy healing miracles into runic spells? 
he had heard of divine weaponry but to his knowledge those required special preparation. Perhaps even if he could copy a healing spell he would need some special material to power it. Then there was also the issue with him feeling terrible, if he attempted to use the eye skill now, he felt like his eye might fall out of its eye socket instead. For the time being, he decided to save this thought for later. Perhaps when he leveled the skill by examining lesser spells he would attempt it on healing miracles. For all, he knew it would put an even greater strain on him than when he activated it down in the dungeon. Thus for now he placed himself in the line that was waiting for healing. This was one of the peculiarities with this church. It was run by an all-female cast of nuns and clerics. In some other churches, he also saw clear favoritism for people that could pay for the services but here there was a proper line. While they did require everyone to pay, he also heard that some of the sisters were offering their services for free in the off hours for the people that just didn't have any money to spare. Praise the sun oh this is a treat, isn't it Mr. Wayland? Finally, after waiting for about 20 minutes it was his turn. After he lowered his hood it was apparent who he was. Sister Kasha knew him the most from that one expedition but from time to time he did have some run-ins with her in the city. Yes it's me, I require your services, Sister Kasha. Oh my, if I knew that you were coming I would have prepared some tea. Why don't you wait a moment, we could have a nice conversation about our holy lady, just the two of us. Um I don't think I have the time for it and the line behind me is quite long, you probably won't be finished that fast. Roland had left early in the morning and it was only the start of the day. Kasha would probably need to be here for most of it, so if he actually waited it would be nightfall before he got healed. By that point, the debuff would have run already out anyway so there would be no reason for him to stay. Oh silly me, I just wanted to catch up on good old times. Then what can I do for you Mr. Wayland, you do look a bit pale, please give me your hand. He nodded while sitting down on a stool in front of her. The priest classes had some special skills through which they could figure out people's alignments. Thanks to those they would know if their skills were good enough to help. It was a strange feeling, the moment she placed her small hand on his it felt as if he was pricked by many tiny needles. This sensation subsided rather quickly and it was time for him to get healed. Without letting go of his palm sister Kasha started performing one of her curing miracles that made his entire body glow in a golden hue. From the onset, it was clear that this debuff wasn't that simple. Normally the curing would go by faster but his body continued to radiate divine energy for a good 15 seconds before Kasha pulled her hand back. Her forehead was a bit moist as it was clear that she had spent a good chunk of her mana on this one cure. That was a peculiar alignment Mr. Wayland but you should be feeling better now. She gave out a huff of relief as she was clearly fatigued. The drowsy feeling that he felt had subsided almost instantly and he was back to his old self. After the treatment was over another nun with a tray came over from the side. Onto it he dropped down some coins, while there was no set price here the nun's facial expression would mostly shift until he got the correct sum. Praise the sun. The trainee nun that was there to collect the coin smiled at him brightly while he felt robbed. While the holy miracles worked faster and didn't have any side effects they did cost a lot more than curing and healing potions. If the situation wasn't dire enough, he would have probably decided to wait but he did need that class change crystal or two. Yes I would also like to make a purchase, is the shrine open? The church store was mostly situated in a side room along with a shrine. Their people could buy various blessed items. Services like imbuing weapons with holy energies were also carried out there. Churches that were stationed close to dungeons with undead creatures were making quite the coin from such services. The shrine is always open to our flock, remember to be quiet as this is the house of the lady. The younger girl nodded while he stood up, Kasha looked a bit drained so he just said his farewells and went towards the shrine. The line of people with various alignments continued to grow so she had other things to worry about. Inside of the shrine he found another nun, this one looked much older than the rest but her level wasn't all that high. It was clear that she didn't have much talent for healing arts and without going on dungeon rungs even priests were unable to level up. 
There were various accessories like necklaces, pendants, armbands, and talismans on display here. They were all imbued with divine energies in some way that was kept hidden away from the public. A craftsman could live a nice life if they ever managed to strike a deal with a city church. They would be given massive amounts of gold but also forced to keep quiet about the ways of making divine gear. For the time being, he just pointed to the section with the class change crystals. After his vigor had returned it was time to check his and Agni's progress. With his skills not being fully matured yet, his wolf would be first in line for an evolution. Then it was time to visit his old apartment yet again, perhaps when he left it, he would have a new class. Well this will be the last chapter for now, we'll be back around the end of the next month. Chapter 190, Agni Evolves Into Volcanic Dire Wolf Fire Slash Earth Slash Beast An evolved variant of the common wolf monster seen in volcanic dungeons. At this point, their entire body begins to be covered by volcanic rock that is both resistant to heat and physical attacks. Ruby Dire Wolf Fire Slash Earth Slash Beast An evolved variant of the uncommon wolf monster seen in volcanic dungeons. The rubies that cover their bodies are resistant to certain magical attacks. Dire Ash Wolf Earth Slash Beast an evolved variant of the common canine type wolf monster found in various dungeons. They are much larger than their lesser evolved variants. Mystical Dire Ruby Wolf Fire Slash Earth Slash Beast A rare variant of the Ruby Dire Wolf. They can be distinguished from the less rare variant by the ruby horn growing out of their forehead. This horn is used by them to channel spells and absorb ambient mana. There aren't as many options available as before. Roland looked at the choices of monster evolutions for his mystical ruby wolf. While there were four options that he could see, there was only one that was realistic. More time had passed this time and Agni's skills were all leveled up. Monsters had an easier time getting their skills maxed out than people of the many races, thus Roland didn't need to wait like the last time. I guess you're becoming a dire wolf Agni. A woo. At this point in time, Roland and Agni were out on the porch. After finishing up his business at the church it was time to help his beast friend to reach the new form. He hoped to get another new rare variant but it didn't seem that Agni would be progressing over the mystical variant. This wasn't bad but after getting rare classes left and right it was strange to not get anything new this time around. Have you decided? Asked a womanly voice from afar that belonged to Elidia. Ha! I wonder how he will look now. Said Bernier that was there as well, his wife was back at her own shop so she would miss this metamorphosis. Yes, I think he will get a bit bigger but won't look that much different, okay everyone just stand back, for now, I'm going to activate the evolution. The shop Elidia was in had a window opening towards the inside of Roland's walled off home. From there she would be able to see how the house wolf reached a new form. While she had seen some beast tamers working at the Adventurer Guild she was still quite interested in seeing how Agni turned out. After Roland activated the evolution option in his system Agni's body started glowing brightly. The light was contained in one spot which allowed them to see most of the change. His mane expanded and the gem on his forehead started to get longer. If this continues he won't fit in the house anymore. The transformation was a success and now everyone was looking at the dire wolf version of Agni. His size increased by about 25%, the mane was covered in even more rubies and his musculature had been enhanced even further. A woo. Agni howled out which caused Bernier along with Elidia to flinch. This was a level 100 monster with its second tier 2 evolution now. Even down in the current dungeon Agni would not find many monsters that could keep up with him. Name Mystical Ruby Dire Wolf L100x0% Type Fire Slash Earth Slash Beast HP 3696 Slash 3696 MP 4387 Slash 4387 SP 5504 Slash 5504 Strength 125 Agility 174 Dexterity 80 
Vitality. 143. Endurance. 155. Intelligence. 143. Willpower. 130. Charisma. 18. Luck. 15. Roland glanced over Agni's new stats and he could see that his tamed beast wouldn't have any problems taking out gold-ranked adventurers. Then there was the elongated horn that was supposed to be able to fling spells at people. Previously he only had a smaller gem that could absorb mana, now it was supposed to be some kind of release point. Whoa, calm down Agni what did I tell you about licking my face? While he was trying to look over Agni's new status page his dire wolf decided to jump on him. If it was Elidia or Bernier they would certainly buckle under the weight but Roland was able to dig his feet in and take it. You're getting heavy even for me. His size had increased even more but it also didn't tell the whole truth. The rubies that were on his body increased his weight even more. His skeletal structure had also been enhanced and the chompers that he had were now even larger and sharper. Some of the skills had evolved and changed names, for instance, the old fiery bite changed into flame bite, ruby tail whip became an enhanced ruby tail whip. There were also some new skills and improvements that he spotted after the evolution finished. Mystical Tier 2 Trait Increases MP by 15% Ruby Tail Dart Skill The ruby tail tip can be launched as a projectile. Fire Breath Skill Produces a stream of fire energy from the beast's mouth. Agni's mystical tier had increased which gave him even more mana to use. This would probably come in handy, all the mana-related skills like mana shaping, mana regulation were there along with something new that he brought up. Destruction Magic Fire Slash Earth L1 Passive Skill Gives the user the knowledge to cast basic destruction spells of the given element. This trait also allows the user to learn other spells from the given element. If the spell can be learned depends on the user's intelligence stat. Instead of a list of spells, he was given a passive skill that was similar to a trait instead. Monsters cast spells in various ways, some used incantations just like humans but for beasts like Agni that would be impossible. Most of the time the monsters would be given various spells to choose from in the form of spell skills. If he understood the explanation correctly, then Agni was given the knowledge to cast some basic spells, at least at first. It seemed that he would also be able to learn or mimic other fire spells if he ever saw them later on. It was also a dual element trait which meant that Agni could learn earth spells and fire spells at the same time. Hum. Well, I have a customer so I'll see you boys around, try not to destroy too much of the workshop. Hey, what do you mean? Elidia shouted out from her window at Roland who was deep in thought and rubbing his chin. I know that look. You're probably going to do some dangerous tests, try not to blow the whole house up. Roland rubbed his head while watching Elidia step away. It seemed that after being around him long enough his tendency to perform dangerous tests in his little secret laboratory was known. The lass is right but what do you always say? Can't make an omelette without breaking some eggs. His assistant just laughed while returning to his own side of the workshop. With so much work on his hands, Bernier was also close to attaining his second tier 2 class. Luckily for him, the higher the rarity of the materials a craftsman worked, the faster they leveled up when working with them. Thanks to all the new durasteel that Roland had brought over along with the new smelter, Bernier was going through levels like crazy. Other young craftsmen would need to prove themselves for over 10 years to be allowed the same privilege. If you need any help just call me but I won't lie. Working with this new smelter and forge is proving difficult even for someone as talented as me. Don't worry, I don't think I'll need any help just focus on your craft, and don't forget to prioritize those golem components, I need to get that prototype ready for the auction house. Bernier's level was a bit low to work on the new materials. Even though he was leveling fast he could also break the expensive equipment if he didn't focus enough. For the time being Roland agreed to give him some space until he got used to it plus he had other things to worry about now. Let's go Agni. 
while his workers were busy with their side he decided to move down into the firing range below. There together with Agni he wanted to test how well his wolf was able to perform spell casting. Okay, do you see that target? First, show me that new tail dart skill, can you hit that dummy from here? It was a little strange to just talk to his tamed beast but he knew that Agni could mostly understand him. Perhaps he wasn't able to pick up on all the words but the intent of them was understood. Woof! Agni's loud bark echoed through the workshop. His voice certainly got a bit deeper after the evolution. One of his dual tails rose up into the air while stretching out to about twice its length. The red gem on the end of Agni's tail was already quite pointy. It had changed in form after the evolution and probably to accommodate this new skill. After Agni took his aim, the ruby tip shot out of his tail at an alarming speed. It connected with the wooden dummy with a loud bang and made it through it to the other side. It then shattered into smaller pieces on the wall behind it. That would probably hurt a lot. Roland looked at the small hole in the target but it was hard to tell how much damage this projectile could do to an armored man or beast. The ruby also was only the size of a dart and had no other special qualities. But it also seemed that the ranged attack could be quickly repeated as Roland saw the ruby on the end of Agni's tail quickly reforming itself. About 15 seconds with two tails, not that bad. Now when facing ranged opponents Agni could pelt them with some ranged attacks that didn't require much concentration. It would also be a good attack to interrupt any spell casters from casting large spells which made this skill somewhat useful. But Roland didn't think it would be strong enough to finish anything off, mostly to be an annoyance to look out for. Okay then, let us move on, Agni I want you to try casting an attack spell at one of those targets, anyone will do, can you do that boy? Now came the real test that he was interested in, could his beast cast spells with that horn? From the trait's explanation, it seemed that Agni was given an injection of knowledge on how to use it. A woo, woof. After receiving the order Agni turned back to the training dummies. He moved his head down a little bit and pointed with the horn on his forehead towards his target. There he stood for a few moments without doing anything, it was as if he couldn't do it but soon enough Roland could see a shift in the mana around that horn. The protruding horn was quite uniform and smooth. It looked quite pointy and could probably be rammed into opponents as well. The mana started swirling around it while moving out of Agni's body. Soon a red light formed at the focal point atop his head. The red light started to quickly shift as it became a ball of flames. At this moment Agni raised his head up before whipping it forward to release this concentrated bolt of fire energy. The spell flew forward the same training dummy and collided with the wood it was made of. A small explosion of flames covered the area around this target made of wood. The wood quickly burst up in flames while some splintered off after receiving the hit. The spell performed here was a simple fire bolt spell which was slightly above a regular mana bolt spell. With the added fire effect it produced a scorching inferno around the point of collision. Alas, this was somewhat a beginner grade spell and it couldn't eviscerate the dummy it hit. Even then, the wood was clearly burning up the added flame effect was clearly successful in causing lasting damage. Roland nodded while pointing out with his hand. The gauntlet that he was wearing started glowing blue before releasing a ball of water towards the burning target. The magical liquid quickly overpowered the flames and caused a lot of smoke and steam to form instead. But with the help of the ventilation system, this room would quickly become clear. Good, not bad. There was some power behind that spell but you'll have to practice Agni, the activation time was quite slow. The firebolt spell that he produced was somewhat sluggish. It was as if Agni was a mage that had to chant the whole spell himself. But this was only the beginning of his tamed beast's spell slinging days. The skill that gave him the knowledge to cast these attacks was only at level 1, then there were all the mana regulating skills that were also there. If Agni just continued to level them up, Roland was sure that the speed would increase. Perhaps he could even reach his own runic spell casting speed. Okay then Agni, show me that fire breath now. The testing continued for a bit longer until Roland was satisfied with his partner's performance. 
he relied on Agni down in the dungeon so he needed to know the extent of his new skills and his physical capabilities. Perhaps with a few more levels, he could task Agni with taking out the boss monster in that cavern to him. After it was done he released Agni back into the wild which was to guard the shop again. With the more ferocious look that he had, it would keep the troublesome elements from starting anything. There would be a bit of a problem with the increase in size. First, he would need to go to the guild to get him checked. Now after reaching level 100 and his second tier 2 evolution Agni would be seen as a dangerous monster. It would be hard to take him into the city without putting a muzzle on him. He could already see some people screaming out in fear if they ever came across Agni without a leash. It would look like some kind of monster was lost in the streets, then someone of Armin's IQ could decide to engage him in battle without hearing them out first. The more troublesome part is when he returns after escorting Elidia to the city, luckily he is fast enough to not be caught by any stupid adventurers. There had been a situation where on the way home Agni was spotted by some new adventurers. He was fast to duck into the forest and run home without causing any trouble. Now he was larger and rarer, Roland wouldn't be surprised if some poachers targeted him for the rare monster parts like the horn on his forehead. I'll worry about that later, I need to focus on myself now. Finally, Roland looked at his own status window again, his level was 125 and he was ready to attempt a class change. Name Roland Arden L125 Classes T2 Runesmith Lord L50 Primary T1 Mage L25 Secondary T1 Runic Monoscribe L25X T1 Runic Blacksmith L25 Tertiary HP 5961-5961 MP 14913-14913 SP 7994-7994 Strength 158 Agility 125 Dexterity 189 Vitality 161 Endurance 173 Intelligence 227 Willpower 207 Charisma 18 Luck. 11. Back in his room, he looked at a job change crystal that he recently bought. To others, he would be gone for seconds but he was unable to foresee just how long the next test would take. If he would take it or wait was also up to debate, first he needed to see what the new class options were. I guess here goes nothing.